This is the Shannon Wong podcast number three. Today's podcast is the marketing of medicine with our guest, Mike Malley. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Great to be here. All right. So there are certain specialties in medicine that involve treatments that are considered elective or cosmetic. And because these treatments are, quote, not medically necessary, insurance companies do not pay physicians for offering these services. They, the patient pays out of pocket. So some common examples in dermatology would be Botox, injectables, fillers, or hair transplantation. In plastic or cosmetic surgery practices, examples would be breast augmentation or cosmetic, facial, or eyelid, or nose surgery. These are all elective procedures. In ophthalmology, the two most common elective procedures we perform are laser cataract surgery and laser lens replacement using premium lens implants, which enable patients over the age of 45 who want to be able to see near, mid, and far without glasses like a younger person. And then there's LASIK surgery, which corrects vision for patients younger than 45 who want to reduce or eliminate their reliance on glasses or contacts. So if a physician offers services that a patient pays for and which insurance does not cover, then the patient can choose to have the elective or cosmetic procedure or they can spend their money on something else that they value. But these patients always go through a process of educating themselves about the elective procedure and then they decide for themselves, am I bothered enough with my current condition to have a procedure to correct or improve it? Is the benefit of the procedure worth me taking the time to have it done, to undergo a recovery process, and for me to spend my hard-earned money on surgery? Is this procedure safe? And how do I choose the best surgeon for this type of procedure? So today's podcast, we will speak with one of the most knowledgeable experts in marketing medicine, specifically ophthalmology, and who has been an invaluable part of the history of our practice since 2012. But first, let me provide a little background. So it's 1997, it's my first year in practice in ophthalmology, and at that time we were advertising for LASIK surgery on billboards in and around Austin. And then from 1997 to 2000, 80 to 90% of our practice was based on LASIK surgery. The remaining 10 to 20% was comprehensive eye care and cataract surgery. From 2000 to 2010, we marketed our practice through a world, through the, to the world through a website, austineye.com, through billboards, print newspaper ads, search engine optimization, print magazine ads, yellow page telephone book listings, radio ads, and some websites that would allow us to create an account for our business like Facebook, and Yelp, which we started using in 2008 and 2009. Most practice marketing involved ideas that were spawned by me and my dad, Mitchell Wong, and basically all marketing was done in-house. Fast forward, it's March 25th, 2011, we're in San Diego, and I'm at an ophthalmology meeting called AMO University, and I hear a speaker talking about elective surgery, and his name is Mike Malley. My impression was that he was an articulate, an enthusiastic individual, and he was um, he was enthusiastic about marketing and ophthalmology. Then later that year, December 5th, 2011, our ophthalmology practice is in need of some professional help, and I basically run out of ideas in my own brain for marketing. So I asked some friends who they would recommend as an expert in creating new radio ads for us, and we're given the name and contact info- information for Mike Malley. So I asked for a sample of Mike's radio commercials for one of his clients in Houston. And after two minutes of listening to these spots, I say to myself, that was so professionally produced, I am incapable incapable of doing that level of work in-house. We need to hire this guy. So we have our first meeting in December, December 20th, 2011, and we've never met. We meet at Fleming's restaurant in the domain in Houston. It's me, my dad, and John Odette, and Mike. And it's the job interview. And uh, you, can, you, can, you can tell me what you recall about that. Uh, but um, so we eventually hire you, and, and um, you, you create some radio ads for us. And I'll play 
one oh of gosh. the radio ads, yeah, that you you created for us. This will be fun. Sounds really good. Let's see here. Put the mic up to my my speaker and see if it turns out okay. Ah, the sweet sounds of taking out a contact lens you've been sleeping in all night long. Okay, open up. That's it. Come on. Stop moving around. Ah, this is ridiculous. Hey, honey, have you seen my glasses? It feels like there's sand in my eyes. At Austin Eye, our eye care professionals think there's a better way to start your day. Just ask any of the thousands of patients who enjoy clear, more natural vision thanks to our safer, blade-free eye LASIK procedure. So unless you just enjoy that put them in take them out daily routine, come and discover a better way to see at Austin Eye. Learn how by calling 250-2020 for a complimentary, no obligation consultation with our renowned surgeons, Dr. Shannon Wong, Dr. Mitchell Wong, or Dr. John Odette. That's 250-2020 or visit us on the web at austineye.com. Austin Eye, see better, live better. So I go, so I was very impressed. And that was the beginning of 2012. Then in April of 2012, you and your team helped us launch a TV campaign promoting a new laser procedure called laser cataract surgery and laser lens replacement that has continued to this day. And we had never run TV ads before 2012, but because you seem to know what you're doing. Um, we took your advice and ran TV spots that you helped us produce in the rest of this history. And our practice has continued to grow year over year, thanks in large part to your talent. Um, so over the years, I've developed a deeper appreciation for your ability to work with people, make them feel at ease, and help them share their stories with you. And with that introduction, I'd like you to share your story with our audience. You've interviewed us many times, but now it's your turn. So thank you for being here. Um, oh, thank you. Wow, that, that commercial brings back a lot of, a lot of good memories. Um, thanks for, for having me today, too. First of all, this is, this is great. It's always fun to come to Austin. Um, but I will never forget our dinner meeting, the, the, the introduction where you guys were interviewing me at Fleming's. And typically, it was not atypical to dinners I have. You know, usually, if I'm meeting a surgeon or a doctor, whether it's at one of the meetings or for business, they'll say, let's go to dinner and let's talk. So I'm accustomed to speaking while I'm eating at the same time. And so I didn't know your practice, and I, you guys seem like great people. And so we had a wonderful dinner. I knew it was very expensive. And so over the course of about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, we're, we're eating and we're speaking and we're having this great dinner. And then at the end, I, you know, I finish and I finish with my kind of my, the thoughts I had and the, the presentation I have. And I said, well, doctors, what do you think? And I looked right at your dad, Dr. Mitchell Wong. And I said, Dr. Mitchell Wong, what do you think? He looked me straight in the. He hadn't said a word. He didn't say many words that night, and and uh, I was expect. I had never even heard him speak, so I thought he might have a different kind of an accent. But when he spoke, first of all, it sounded just like Tommy Lee Jones, <laughs> like this great Texan, you know. And I said, uh, when I said, "How do you? What do you think?" He says to me, "Well, I think you speak pretty good with food in your mouth." <laughs> And that was it. And then I think you and John said, uh, "Yeah, yeah, this sounds good, and we'll 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 talk this over, and then we'll get back with you." So I I was kind of put back by that comment. I thought, "Oh my God!" So I get in my car, I call my wife, I said, "Honey, I think I just blew this presentation really bad because when I got done, Doctor Wong just said he thinks I speak pretty good with food in my mouth." So the relationship that began like that has now been what eight years mm -hmm. and i've learned what a gentleman he is and how much fun you guys are to work with and just what a quality operation you have so i'm glad i didn't i didn't blow that that first uh interview uh uh too badly well two two out of the three people at the table wanted to hire you so the majority won <laughs> the majority won i <laughs> yes. loved it i loved it all right so how did it all begin for you in the world of uh, marketing and medicine and 
refractive surgery. Yeah. So do we, how far back do we want to go? We want to go back to uh, my. Wherever you want to start. Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, a lot of the success, I'm not saying that, that I'm that successful, but a lot of my success today, I still give thanks to the Marine Corps for. I went in the Marine Corps very young at 17 because I didn't have any money, number one. My parents didn't have any money to go to college. I wanted to go to college, but I couldn't get there. And I probably needed some discipline. So I go in the Marine Corps at 17, and um, I, didn't, I didn't know much about life other than I needed to go in to get the GI Bill. Well, I go in the Marine Corps, and I get injured on the rifle range during boot camp. And I have to go to the Balboa Hospital. And this is 1973. And um, so I, I'm in the hospital, and they make me a runner for officer's country. And so I could go, I'd go to officers, which is another side of the base. And I would um, sit there and they'd say, hey, take this over to headquarters or take this over here. So I, all I did was go back and forth between officers. And so one day this officer was there and I said, sir, would you mind if the private asked you a question? He said, no, what do you want to know? I said, well, why are things on this side of the base so much nicer? Why do you guys have nicer cars, better housing, prettier women, you know, all these things on, on this side of the base? What, what's, what's the big difference? He said, son, there's only one bit of difference, one thing that differs between where you wake up every morning on this space and where I wake up every morning on this space. I said, what is that? He said, college. You go to college, you become an officer, you get this. You don't go to college, you stay where you are. And as simple as that sounds, I thought, that's life? Is that the, the, the drawing line and that, that I have to cross? And so I... Uh, I, I'll never forget, and that's been how many years, but um, so I got out of the Marine Corps, and I went to, uh, to college, and during the Marine Corps, I was a pretty decent athlete. How long were you in the Marine Corps? I was in the Marine Corps four years active and two years uh, reserve. Mm -hmm. So in the Marine Corps, I was playing football, basketball, baseball. I learned that if you played sports, it kind of kept you away from some of the other military-type things that were going on. Well, I ended up excelling in volleyball of all things. I made the Marine Corps volleyball team and I was I was traveling for the Marine Corps playing volleyball a lot. Mm -hmm. And that took me uh, away from my other duties, you know, that were that Marines do uh, all the time. And so when I got out of college, I went to Texas A&M and to enroll and they said, "Hey, do you want to join they have a, there's a corps there at Texas A&M. It's military." So you're like 21. I'm not 21. Okay. And I, I'm saying, I am going to college because that officer told me if I don't go to college, I'm going to be on the wrong side of the equation my whole life. So I go to A&M. They said, they said, you want to join the Corps? I said, no, I've already been in the Marine Corps. So I don't want any more Marines. I just seem to like to go to college. Mm -hmm. So I go there. We founded the A&M Volleyball um, Club. And we all, we excelled in, in men's volleyball in college. And got us, and that ended up leading uh, leading me to a scholarship uh, to play volleyball Division One, and that then in turn um, led to me going to Italy because in I don't know if you remember in 1980 President Carter he canceled the Summer Olympics mm -hmm. and they were in Moscow, mm -hmm. and so we didn't get to go to the Olympics. Not that I, it would have been hard for me to go anyway, but because we couldn't go to the Olympics, I went to Europe to play professional volleyball. And right at the same time, I'd, I'd come out of college and started my journalism career. So you finished college. Where, I, when did you, how, so what year is it that you're leaving the Marines and starting at A&M? 1977, I left the Marines. Okay. And then I went to A&M. I was at A&M two years uh -huh. and started this, this volleyball club. And then we got noticed by some Division I College coaches, uh -huh. and so a couple went to UCLA. I actually went to Ball State University because they have got a very good Midwestern volleyball team. We play Ohio State and Penn State, uh -huh. but they had a very, very um, kind of famous volleyball program there with Don Shondell, our coach. And so I went to Ball State, and when I uh, and I majored in journalism, and so I always wanted to be a journalist. I was a pretty good writer, and um, so I, I come out of uh, college. I become a journalist in a small town in Texas called called Humble, where the H is silent. And, and in that town, there was a, an ophthalmologist named Dr. Mike Mann. It's about 1981. This 82. is 1982. Uh -huh. And Dr. Mann was a very progressive cataract surgeon at the time. 
was uh, I'm not sure he was doing any refractive, true refractive back then, but he was um, a very uh, progressive cataract surgeon who was leaving the hospital and was going to open up his own outpatient surgery center. That was pretty, that was a major step back then. So he was submitting articles to my newspaper about uh, phaco emulsification or advances in cataract surgery or, or the benefits of outpatient cataract surgery. And I would take these articles that he submitted to my paper and I'd make them sound better. I'd turn them into articles and, and I would per- say, Man Eye Clinic setting new standards in cataract surgery in Texas. And Dr. Mike Mann, leading cataract surgeon, discusses Faco emulsification. So you were on the sales side, or sales side, or the advertising? I was side? on the, the actual journalism, the writing side. We had a uh-huh. sales team, but I was I was the editor of the newspaper, uh-huh. so I was. But it was a small paper, so I would rewrite. So he'd submit a press release. I'd rewrite the press release, run it in our newspaper as an actual article, and so people were reading these articles. And Man Eye Clinic became in Northeast Houston became. A pretty big, you know, practice, and it grew and grew and grew, and um, so about 1985 or so, um, I decided to go to Italy to play vol- professional volleyball, and I left my. And about that time, I was doing all this ophthalmology writing; it was becoming pretty good at it. Mm-hmm. And Doctor Mann was asking me to do some things, and when I came back from playing volleyball in Italy, he said, "Hey, would you like to come to work for me?" as a marketing person in ophthalmology. And so I was a good journalist and I was pretty creative. And I thought, I said, well, I asked him, and I said, why, why do you need some, a marketing person in medicine? So I thought your patients just come to see you. He says, no, we have to let patients know what's happening in our industry. And that's the medical marketing side of this. And I said, well, is it kind of like, I'm blind and now I see. And he says, yeah, it's kind of like you can promote that I was blind and now I see. And I said, if I can't promote that, then I can't promote what a, what a great field to be in because they were, I learned, I didn't know much about ophthalmology, but I learned that people really were, this, this restoration was going on where you, they, were, they were getting, to, older people were getting depressed and they couldn't see and they couldn't do the things they once wanted to do. And then you do this surgery and all of a sudden they're seeing better they're feeling younger. They're getting back to doing hobbies. And I thought, and somehow I felt good <laughs> promoting. I wasn't a surgeon. I thought, I can't imagine how the surgeons feel doing that to people. And so I thought, man, I, I've hit the jackpot. This is a great field to be in because there's no, there's not much trauma. Patients are, are pretty uh, comfortable and active and there's no pain. And it's, 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 it's a wonderful field. So from night, that was about 1986. I went to work for Dr. Mann, you know, full time. You were four years or so with I the I was paper. four years out of, with, with the paper mm-hmm. and four years out of college. And, and um, there's something I never knew when you're a journalist. You're on the other side that no one gets to cross. So when you're a journalist for today, it's, you know, it's digital, multimedia, television, whatever. But you're on, a, you're on the, the reporting side of life. And, and very few people get to live over there where the public trusts you to report things back to them. There's a, you, you, you don't see it, you don't know it, but, it, but you're on that side of the, of the fence. The rest of the fence is the retail world, the medical world, the real world. Journalists are their own group, and there's a line you don't cross until, when you're a journalist. So when I left journalism and went to work for Mike Mann, it was a very emotional moment walking out the front door of our newspaper because I, I, I told myself I'm never going back. I'll never be able to go back, I don't think, because I've left, I've crossed the line. I'm now going into marketing, advertising, and not a journalist. Was it the best thing I've ever done? Yes, in many ways. Did I miss not having a true journalistic career? You know, perhaps. But you, So something about Mike Mann convinced you to leave that world what was it yeah so if you know mike Mann, so what i've what i've learned in 30 years in ophthalmology is that good cataract surgeons are good people they have good per- they're good with people they're good with patients and they have passion and they believe in what they do and mike Mann was that guy mike Mann, 
He was, he was great with his employees. He was great with seniors. He was great with his surgical staff, had great surgical skills, but he was able to really share his passion with people, you know, in a, in a real emotional way, in a positive way. And I thought, man, this guy's, this guy's going places. And he, and he did. He, he grew from one little location in, in, in Umble to Umble Kingwood. And then we put him on television. And he was a very handsome you know, surgeon, too, back in the day when, when it wasn't very – it wasn't popular or really um, – it wasn't the norm for, for doctors to be pra- um, advertising marketing on television. So we put Dr. Mann, we said, he said, what, what, how should we promote my practice? I want to go into Houston. We're in way, we're 35 miles from Houston. I want to go capture all of Houston. I said, Dr. Mann, the only medium, the best medium for you, if we're targeting seniors, I said, seniors watch a lot of television. You, you have the right look and the right passion and to, to deliver this message via television. Let's go on television. And so we went to CBS in Houston. And, and credit was shooting on 35 millimeter film back in the day. First people to do that and produce these very beautiful commercials with Mike Mann just walking on saying, hi, you know, exciting breakthroughs are now happening in ophthalmology. And, if, you know, with cataract surgery, I mean, all of a sudden he was capturing as much cataract surgery as possible. People what they wanted to go to him for their for their cataract surgery. And so one day we're about a year into this process. And he says, Mike. He says, I think we need to think again about this marketing of um, on television. I said, why is that? He said, well, the, the, some of the fellows down at the Houston Ophthalmological Society meeting, they kind of frown upon medical marketing. 1988, 89, they frown upon doctors going on television. So I said, Dr. Mann, I get it. I said, but let me ask you this question. I said, how many cataract surgeries per month your colleagues at the Houston Ophthalmological Society meeting refer to you every month. He says, zero, you're right, let's keep marketing. (laughs) So we did that for a couple of years and we grew the practice. And I thought, I can do this for more than one ophthalmologist. I think I I like this so much, I wanna go form my own company. And um, I said, Dr. Mann, I said, I said, I really wanna expand my company and grow it and help help more doctors like you, you know, do this. He said, hey, that's a very, that's a great goal for you. I'm, I'm happy for you, but I really want someone to stay in, in, uh, in-house in my practice. So I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go. I don't have a non-compete. I'm going to go work with somebody else in Houston. He said, that's okay. So I go out and I find Dr. Ralph Berkeley and Dr. Stephen Slade just starting their practices. Okay. How did you find them? And well, they or were. Did with, they find you? Yeah, or what happened they. I I knew of Houston Eye Clinic at the time. It's called Houston Eye Clinic, and they were super progressive in refractive surgery. It was this procedure called radial keratotomy. This is what year? This is 1988. 1988. Okay. So radial care. Doctor Berkeley had done radial keratotomy on just about every police officer, fireman, person in Houston uh, because it was covered by their insurance. And so I thought, okay, I've left Dr. Dr. Mann. Let me go talk to the people at Houston. Uh, first of all, I went to Houston Eye Associates. Great practice. They have 28 ophthalmologists. I thought, these guys can take over the world. So I go to Houston Eye Associates. and You, you cold called them. I, kinda, I walked in. Yeah, just cold called. And I said, hey, I'm the guy that just that, that, that did all the marketing for Mann Eye Clinic for Dr. Mann. I'm looking for a new client. So you're in Houston. You're working exclusively with Mike Mann, and then, but in the meantime, you're gathering, you're gaining an awareness of what the ophthalmology marketplace is like in Houston. Right. I knew that I could only okay. work with one practice uh-huh. per city because we have we're we're seeking patients across the market. So I could only work with one. Plus, I was I was technically unemployed. I needed to have a client. I didn't have any. I I I knew what I knew, and I was confident in my abilities, but I didn't have a, a client. So I said, I have to go. They, they weren't coming to me because there, was a, there wasn't any medical marketing back then other than what we were doing. So I went to Houston Eye Associates. It, everything was fine. But there were so many doctors there, they couldn't agree on just that decision to hire me. And I thought, okay, if you 28 ophthalmologists, great surgeons, can't agree to even 
hire me, how are we ever going to agree on a marketing message, on a direction, on a budget? I said, thanks guys, not my cup of tea. I go to Houston Eye Clinic. It's Dr. Berkeley and this young doctor, Stephen Slade. And they were uh, working together. They were working together. Oh. And so um, I said, hey, I'm the guy that, that was working with uh, Dr. Mann. We did their TV commercials. I have this company now. And they hired me, basically. And it from, was just the two of them. There was there was two of those two. It was those two, and then um, some other surgeons came came after. But it was really just those two. I'm not sure if Mike Kaplan was was around yet. And Rick Baker. Was Rick, oh, Rick or? Baker was there. Yeah, okay. Doctor Rick Baker, he's the right. optometrist. Mm -hmm. And so they were all there at Berkeley Eye Center. Mm -hmm. And so that began my relationship with Berkeley Eye Center. And so then Berkeley Eye Center. Um, at, at one point, joins with Man Eye. They merged uh, this thing. Uh, the first, there was the PRG merger, the Physicians Resource Group. Uh, that was a, uh, the first private equity pursuit. Uh, when all the practices came together, we tried to do a marketing plan where all the practices in Houston came together. Didn't work. So the next step was Man and Berkeley decided to come together. So they created Man Berkeley Eye Center. Um, when and man, when was that? Um, wow, I, I, I don't even know what year that was. See, because I was in Houston from '85 to '93, so I'm aware of some of these things. Yeah, uh -huh. it was probably after '93, though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's probably more after 2000. Mm -hmm. And so they merged, and then I had all the business. And so then I thought, okay, now I have some business. I'd like to get some more business. So you were only working with Man Berkeley Slade. Yeah, that Mike that, Mann, that group, uh, that group in, in Houston, uh, one city, in one city. Uh -huh. And then I said, uh, I heard about. Um, we can back up a little bit. There was a guy, a doctor named uh, Slava Fyodorov in Russia, the father of radio keratotomy. Mm -hmm. He knew a surgeon in Atlanta, Georgia, named Bob Marmer, and so somehow Bob Marmer found out that we were doing medical marketing early on in refractive surgery. So Bob calls me and he says, do you have a, do you do this? And I really, I didn't have much of a company and didn't have much, any clients. I said, of course we do that. He said, well, I'd like for you to come to Atlanta. And I said, here's what I'll do. I'll come to Atlanta. You pay for the ticket. I'll come to Atlanta. I'll be there two or three days. I'll, I'll, you know, we'll get a game plan and do a marketing strategy and then I, and I'll fly back. And if you don't like my report after I finish uh, giving it to you, you don't owe me a dime. You only owe me if you want to work with me, then then we'll go forward together. Well, working through Bob Marmer, Bob Marmer was, was another great surgeon who happened to be best friends with Slava Fyodorov, the father of refractive surgery. So I got to meet, I got to meet him. And then I heard about the all the uh, the things going on in Russia with radio keratotomy, and then my name started to get associated with radio keratotomy, which I thought was probably a good thing. But radio keratotomy was at the end of its play, you know, in the '80s, coming into the '90s, we started getting into laser vision correction. So, and then we learned about hyperopic shift and all those things that, <laughs> that go on with radio keratotomy. Mm -hmm. So, and that, so then the, um, there was another, another uh, father-son team in Toronto. So in, in the 90s, before laser vision correction was approved in the United States, they could do it in Canada. And so uh, Harold Stein and Ray Stein and Albert Cheskis, uh, they heard about me and they said, hey, can you come to Toronto and can you help us grow our our medical practice through your marketing? I said absolutely. So I, I was flying up to to Toronto every every month to meet with Harold Stein, Ray Stein, and, and Al Cheskis. I never knew I needed a work permit to work in Canada. So I'm I'm just I go up and I go back. And one day it's on a Sunday evening. I'm going through customs. They said, "What are you doing here?" I said, "I'm coming to work." They said, "Do you have a work permit?" I said, "No." They go, "Who are you here to see?" I said. Dr. Harold Stein, and they, they, you have a medical permit? No, I don't. And so ended up being this very complicated, I ended up in this line of foreigners from Asia and Russia and all, you know, we were all applying for work permits. So then I, I get through that finally. And then later on, um, one of the doctors say, look, 
when you come through next time, just say you're here for a business meeting. There's no you know business transpiring, or you're here for a dinner, or you're here on vacation, but you're not ever here working. <laughs> so I ended up not officially working, but it's what's ironic in, um, I was in Toronto at their practice at 9-11. Mm. I was supposed to leave to fly back that morning. And when 9-11 hit, no one could cross the border. Mm. So I was in Toronto for seven days, staying at the Four Seasons Hotel on their nickel, their dime. And uh, it, I mean, they were, they were fabulous. But it was a very emotional time to be away from your family, your wife, your children, can't go home, you're afraid to fly. Uh, but I was there on, on, on 9-11. Mm. Mm. And I learned a lot about marketing laser you know, vision correction you know, in Canada. And it's we, just before, but it must have been before 1995. Yes, yes. Because LASIK came to the U.S. in 1995. Right. It was these were it was 90 through 94. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. Um, they marketed in Canada. They marketed in Canada, and right when, so right before, so 94, we devised a marketing strategy to market into all the the sister cities along the U.S. border. Their next step was to come down to Detroit, Niagara Falls, you know, New York, you know, the New York State area was to come down into uh, from uh, Vancouver down into Seattle. Were they marketing mainly to Canadians or were they marketing mainly they were to main, the United States or Americans? Initially, it was just Canadians, uh -huh. but then they wanted that U.S. market, uh -huh. you know, because it wasn't approved down here. And they were so they were getting they were getting a lot of patients from the U.S., going to uh, Toronto to have their surgery because it wasn't approved here. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time, I don't know, have you heard of the black box lasers? Yes. So I became the black box laser marketing guy. We had six clients with black box lasers mm -hmm. that were you know, performing laser vision correction without you know, an approved device right. from either Visex or Summit back in the, back in the day. And so we were doing all that, and I was, but I was using the same marketing tactics I learned in Canada down here in the States. So we were marketing in the States laser vision correction before it was officially approved. Amazing. That was, mm -hmm. yeah, that was fun. <laughs> okay, so it's, you're, you're working with the Steins? Yes, working with the Steins. And then where did it go from there? So from there, um, I... Um, I come back to the states, and it's and refractive surgery is is full blown now. Radio radio keratotomy. Well, we went through radio keratotomy. Then we went through lamellar keratoplasty. Then we went through automated lamellar keratoplasty. And so, what happened was, Dr. Berkeley and Dr. Slade were very progressive in that early refractive post RK era. They were doing surgeries down in you know in Colombia, South America. And so we, it was just a super exciting time, and we were right in the middle of all that. I mean, I still remember promoting AK and ALK, you know, through marketing, and that. But when laser cat, when laser vision correction hit the U.S. market, then really the the advertising and marketing really blew up then, and then our and our business along with it. We went from, you know, having a handful of clients to having. 30, 40, you know, clients across the country. And we can only work with one practice per, per market. And so, I mean, I was flying, I mean, uh, today I'm a 2 million miler on United Airlines. And a lot of that was because we were flying. I never could, every city was, I could only have one client per city. So I was to work with a client in Seattle, I'd go to Seattle. Or if it was New York City, I'd go to New York City. Or that's just what I did. And uh, I'd fly home for the weekends and, but, but, I knew that in my business, from a marketing standpoint, if if we didn't take on the business when we were offered the opportunity, we may not get that opportunity later on. Mm -hmm. So I was I would always welcome uh, new business. We turned down a lot of practices because we had conflicts. We could never have another. You know, we couldn't do another one in Austin or mm -hmm. San Antonio or Houston. One client per city. one client per city because we were we were seeking patients across the marketplace. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's what that was. And back in that time, it was what? Radio and print? It was radio and print. That was, this is all pre-web. Yeah. And so we were big on radio and big on, on print. And we were, you know, TV was also big, but it was expensive. Uh, but we learned early on that TV was a better medium for 
the presbyopic age and the cataract age. There were just more, there's more, more predictable viewing patterns. By the older we get, the more predictable we become. I remember in, in our, mid nineties, there were infomercials like 30 minutes long on LASIK surgery. We did several infomercials. We shot one in a planetarium for Gary Tylock. He's a big surgeon in Dallas. Right. We shot the, um, a 30 minute television program with a, with an on-camera spokesperson. It looked, it looked like a real TV program, but inside a planetarium because a lot of the same technology used in today's lasers were, were, were kind of borrowed from the Hubble telescope um, technology, which I thought was, so we combined, we said, hey, when you look to the stars, it's the same way as the you know the, the eye and the way the eye works and all those. It was a very interesting, very fun project to do. How um, effective were those infomercials, those long ones? 30 yeah, minutes? so they were great because education back then was you could there wasn't any uh, there wasn't a Wikipedia, there wasn't a Google, right? So it was very difficult to to, to educate patients. So the hardest part was buying buying the time. The, a lot of the airtime was being bought up by national 30-minute you know, infomercial promoters. So we'd go in and try and buy up. What you really wanted was a, a 5 p.m. on a Saturday or the, you know, the 10 o'clock on Sunday morning before church. Uh, you didn't want anything during the daytime. The, the stuff at 2 o'clock in the morning, you get very cheaply, but you get, you get the, the patient who's awake at 2 o'clock in the morning buying things on television. So they were all designed to make a, the phone ring. And then you had to have people, so it was a much different protocol back then because if, if you aired, you had to have someone, not a cell phone, there was no, there was no cell phones back then for the most part. Mm -hmm. it, you had to have people in, in a phone bank studio, so it was, but it was direct response. The program ran, you got people who wanted to, and then, then they, most people back then, when they called, they would come in because again, they couldn't go online. Yeah, pre web. This they, is how you get your info. You you have to come in to get yeah. the info. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, mm -hmm. that was it. You know, when I, I, I one of my so what I, I speak a lot, it, and so what I learned. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I was never a very good public speaker. I just was afraid, and so I got to be this person in ophthalmology where I started to be asked. Well, you saw me in San Diego. Before that, it was 1988, 89, 90. I was being asked to speak at these national medical conventions on Mar ASCRS, ESCRS, ASOA. And I thought, I'm not that guy. But I knew from a business standpoint, I have to be that guy. I felt, I'd go to these meetings and I'd, I'd say, um, I know more than that speaker up there knows about, about medical marketing because I'm living it every day. So I, I need to be that that person. So I said, but I, I mean, it, it, I'm not a good public speaker. And you don't know that until I didn't want to be, I didn't want my first public speaking opportunity with 500 ophthalmologists to be my test run and, and me go, ah, ah. I mean, because the audience is smarter than me. They're better educated than me. I, ha I have to be ready. So I went to this thing called Fearless Speaking in Houston. Mm. And my wife said, you're a pretty good speaker. I said, I'm speaker this, I'm fine. But I said, I don't, I don't, I don't, I've never spoken publicly to big, large, important, smart groups. And so this, the, I went to this course called Fearless Speaking. How'd you find this? I went, uh, I didn't go online. I was going to say I went online. Um, it may have been radio. It may have been radio, actually. Um, and it, it said, you know, do you have a fear of public speaking? And I said, I don't know if I have a fear. I just want to be better. Maybe that's a fear. I don't know. So I go to the, and there, we go to this class and it's in a hotel in one of those rooms and there's 20 of us. And I'm telling you, it's every walk of life you can imagine. And everyone, they start off by saying, just, just state your name. And some people couldn't even state their name in a group looking up at this person on the, on the, on the thing. I, I didn't have that problem. So I, we went through this, this whole six week course of, learning how to speak. But the most memorable thing I ever learned is they played a clip from The Godfather. And in the clip, he said, I want you to listen now and watch the, what there is, it was the, if you ever watch The Godfather, it's when they're all the Godfathers are in this, in this room, there's a big table and they're all speaking about different things. And then the main Godfather, um, what's his name? Uh, uh, played by, not my, not, 
Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando. Mm-hmm. So and he had that, you know, he had to mm-hmm. so so the, the he's playing this 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 segment on his television. And then Marlon Brando says, I want to tell you one thing that when to tell you come, you know, he, he, he just lowered his voice and he whispered to the, cause he had that stuff in his, you know, he just I said, oh, dude, he had it really low. So then, then the guy stops the, um, stops the tape. He said, cause, cause every, all, all the Godfathers were speaking, but Brando's was this, oh, low, yeah, low. and he said, what do you, what did, what did you see there? What do you, what's what's different? Tell me about what what's powerful there. Everybody, like, oh, this guy over here, the Italian. He, I said, I said, man, I said, I had to kind of stop what I was doing and lean in and listen when Marlon Brando was whispering. He goes, that's the secret of public speaking, the power. He goes, he says, he said, here's what I want you to do on your first course. Yes, you have to have projection and you have to have all that. But at one point in your presentation. Just say, I want to tell you one powerful thing, and then I want you to lean down and I want you to, to listen and whisper that very quietly and then and then pause. And so I, I'm at I'm at Hawaiian Eye meeting or something, and I said, I'm gonna try that. <laughs> and, and here's two hundred people in the audience. And um, and I said, you know what one of the most important things about ophthalmic marketing is this. Then I paused and I looked out there. And, and every single eye, because you've given lectures, you, you, they're, they're looking at me and they're waiting. And I said, I think I've arrived. I, 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 I had no fear, none, because I was, they were looking at me waiting to hear what I, what I wanted to say. So that became, that, that whole public speaking thing became, oh, I never, I've never marketed my company. I've never advertised my company in 32 years. Never did a TV commercial. Never did, a, you know. Never did a, a web ad. Never, and there's, I've never had to market my company in 32 years, which is unbelievable. But I, but I knew that if I'm out speaking in public, that that would be the way that I got more business was be by sharing and giving what I've learned. So when I speak to ophthalmologists now, I always want to get their attention. So I'll say, you know, there's there's when I speak to ophthalmologists, I'll say there's good news and there's bad news. Uh, for ophthalmologists, I said, "Which one do you want to hear first? Have you heard this before?" Mm, no. So, what, what would you like to hear first—the good news or the bad news? Let's say the the bad news. Well, the bad news is we're all going to die at some point. None of us get out of here alive. We're all going to die, and then everybody goes, "Wow!" I mean, what you're probably thinking now? What can be the good news? Well, the good news is when you're speaking, when you're telling this to a group of ophthalmologists, I say the good news is before we die. 93.4% of us need cataract surgery. <laughs> and that's job security. Mm-hmm. So I, that was the good news and the bad news about, about being an ophthalmic surgeon. Mm-hmm. So it grew from, from there. It just, you know, I was fortunate that every time that your industry had a breakthrough, whether it's small incision, no incision, laser cataract surgery, laser vision correction, you know, a, a new method of doing LASIK or anything else, that was always information for us to take back to the public and share and share and share. So, I mean, ophthalmology, what I've learned, what I would tell anybody listening to this podcast is that the public is hungry for information. And in, in your market, there, there aren't, I mean, we felt like there weren't enough doctors sharing, like they go to a meeting, and they, they you hear all the latest breakthroughs. They'd come back and they do what you probably do. Monday morning, you get up, you go see patients, or maybe you got a surgery and you come back. And, and so there was this, this, I'm back in the routine. But as we've discovered with you, you go out and you share exciting, life-changing technology that can help people. They get it. You know, we saw these famous surgeons who were the best kept secret in their community. They go to these meetings and they're these rock stars. They're just, you know, and they come home and very few people know about them because they're more academic than they were marketers. So they come back, they're these fabulous surgeons, and then they they might call me and say, hey, can you help me? And I'd say, oh my gosh, you're, you're, you're the guy in ophthalmology. They'd say, well, I'm not the guy in my town. You know how that goes. So you don't want to be the best kept secret in your community if you have incredible things to share. So that's where I learned, I said, 
you need to share. Don't be that best kept secret. And so we just help guys. When you go to a meeting, if you go speak at a meeting and share something, we come back and share it with your hometown. Yeah, like <clears throat> to build a business. I think in medical school these days, one of my missions to teach the next generation of doctors is tell them, hey, this is a business. Yes, you want to help people. That's the foundation. And you're going to help a lot of people. And you need to be honest and bright and hardworking. Um, but a lot of the, the kind of conventional training is um, do research, help the world through research, help the world through charitable work, etc. But the reality is if you don't build the business, you can work your whole life and have not that much to show for. Um, and a lot of people, and the, there's no free lunch. You can, you can do, you can build a business through academic work, through clinical or basic science research. Uh, and you have to publish your work and share it and hire a team to collect data, review data, do statistical analysis, submit it to um, journals of academic medicine, and uh, that gets you recognized. And so then you can talk about these topics in national meetings, or you you get noted because your publications are all over the internet, or you could uh, you could lecture to other physicians, and maybe they'll refer to you, or you if you want to do the non-academic route, uh, you could build relationships through co-managing. But if you co-manage, there's there's a price to pay for everything. So if you co-manage, you have to share the, the financial resources with your referring doctors, and you have to uh, hire a team internally to um, manage the referral network that you try to build, and, and that takes time. And you've got to meet these doctors and those doctors move in and out of your market. Um, and if you if you do external marketing, um, there's a price to pay for that. That's not inexpensive, <laughs> but that's another way to build the brand. But I think that if, if a doctor doesn't do any of those, then they're gonna have a hard time just generating enough business through internal marketing and through word of mouth, or they can have a website but I think that in order to actually do better than average, if a doctor wants to do better than average, they have to do one of those three things, and they all require a lot of work and effort or investment in one way or another time or financial resources to build that business channel through academic time or lecturing time or co-managing time or marketing and we didn't do the others so we were we were a practice that was around by the time we met with you for i don't know 30 38 39 years a lot of longevity but i think we had reached a plateau and i go well we have to try something different in order to get better well i don't want to do those other things but we'll try this marketing thing because we've done it kind of in-house and then we went to you and y yeah, y you have this ability to, to make it mass market it in a way that makes everything look really good and professional. And so that helped us a lot. And, and so you, you started doing this with other clients. Tell us where you went from the mid nineties on forward. Yeah. So the mid, I've always thought there's a good point you just made. I've always thought that, they should. So now you can get an MBA with going to medical school if you want one. That, that may be overkill. But I do think that, that young doctors should get a, some business courses and running a business uh, before they get out of medical school. Because too many get into a practice and they just they don't realize there's a business behind the practice of medicine. And so, so that's, a, that's a very good point. After the 90s, I was fortunate to run into people like, uh, you know, Stephen Brent, you know, and he was another, you know, legend in ophthalmology, refractive surgery. And that led to, uh, I learned that when you know one of those, you meet another one. So then I met Dr. Kerry Solomon and then, you know, and it just became one, you know, after another, Dr. Bruce Wallace, you know, guy in Louisiana, another another legend. Those legends are all my age or older now. Uh, 
but Lynn McMahon, Norm Stahl, Bill Ellis out in California, Jim Loden. I mean, just I mean, I was fortunate because there was a certain group of of doctors, refractive surgeons, who from a business standpoint were pushing that envelope in refractive surgery, and they wanted to grow their practices. And so, what I've learned is that is that <laughs> there's a, there's and what I learned early on was well, there's a lot of people like your father, who it's a breed of doctor. So some some are they're just great doctors. Some are are pioneering surgeons with a passion for growth and for sharing and building something. So there's a whole group of guys like that, Mickey Gordon, Perry Bonder, where they they were great surgeons, Mitchell Wong, but they wanted to grow and they had that they they had a business sense, they had a passion for doing it and sharing, and they just loved growing their practices, and it came naturally. I don't know where they where they uh, learned that concept, but but it's like this whole group of doctors, they were the pioneers and they wanted to grow and they did and they built and they invested. I mean, as you know, none of this technology is, is inexpensive. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes in investments. Then you've got to pay for the marketing. Then you've got to pay if you're co managing you gotta pay. So so I was I was always the person they would say, Okay, look, I'll invest in this technology. Here's the procedure that we're going to do. It's up to you to get it out to the public and get patients to my door. So our, our goal was always, you know, to, to, to share. I've always thought that education was the best method of, of, of marketing that there is. And so too soon, like with LASIK, the, the, the marketing all became, with the, with the corporate discount centers of today, you're marketing a price, LASIK for $220 or LASIK for $250 or you know, or this savings, that savings. But initially, early on, the best marketing was it was about tech advances in technology. I mean, and, and it started with, you know, from, from cataracts right up to LASIK and today with, you know, eye design 2.0 and contour vision LASIK and you know, all those things. But, you know, I, again, I was just fortunate to always be in that inner circle of people who were actively promoting their practices and, and wanting to, uh, and that's, that's always led to more meet, meeting other people where there's this interesting dynamic in ophthalmology that, that I learned that like someone would think, they, they would think, well, if you work, if you're good enough to work for Dr. Brent or Dr. Solomon or Dr. Wallace or Dr. whoever it was, then you're surely good enough to work for little old me. I'm, you know, I'm going to be, I want to be the next Bruce Wallace, the next, you know, Mickey Gordon, the next, you know, whatever. So, that's always benefited me very well. And, and now, so going through the 90s and, the, and then the, the early 2000s, our business continued to grow as, as it did. And, uh, and there's never been a time where there hasn't been some technology or some growth going on that we, that we couldn't share with the public. And so that, that, that's led to today, there truly is, a, the business of ophthalmology is I think we've entered the the I think we've entered retail ophthalmology is what I what I call it. Some doctors think retail ophthalmology. What are you talking about? And I'll say that when patients come into your practice and they have keep, keep in mind yeah, yeah. that <clears throat> there's going to be some some medical student or some resident or some ophthalmologist who's going to watch this. They're going to be thirty years old plus or minus three years. And what you tell them about this, it may impact how they practice or shape their practice right. for the following 30 years. Yeah, well, here is where we've arrived in ophthalmology today. The practice pays a little bit, insurance pays a little bit, and the patient pays a little bit. And that can vary according to what, what procedure. That, so that is the future. The future will not be Medicare or a, a, um, a payer covering everyone's procedure costs. Those days are gone. What the, our method today is preserving the future of Medicare and insurance for the future, I'm convinced, because the, practices, the practice pays in terms of equipment, uh, the practice itself, staffing, everything else. You aren't reimbursed for going out and buying a new laser, a new, you know, OPD or, or whatever it is. You have to buy that. So the practice pays, then insurance pays their their component, and then the patient pays the remaining out of pocket. So we tell patients today, this is the practice of ophthalmic medicine, and this is preserving Medicare for the next generation. So 
Medicare approves everything we do. Medicare just doesn't pay for everything we do. It's our job now as, as marketers and your job as surgeons that retail ophthalmology is this. Retail ophthalmology business will transpire when perceived value equals asking price. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. It's a good thing because it, it really ups your game as a surgeon. You have to enhance a patient's value, perceived value of everything you do. But when you do that, as you've seen, you'll say for bilateral laser lens replacement or laser cataract surgery, the cost is X. Your insurance will pay for this. Your out-of-pocket expense is going to be this or insurance is paying for nothing. If we do a good job, then patients appreciate that and they, they will pay and they, and they do pay. Here's why I think that's a much better way to practice medicine. When I was in, in 1984, um, we were marketing cataract surgery for Dr. Mann, let's say. If we wanted to, uh, if we wanted to, to generate a 20% profit on the practice, we had to do everything 20% faster. There was no, there was no balance billing. So you couldn't charge patients anything back then. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to go, if you wanted to grow your practice 20%, you had to push through 20% more patients, do 20% more surgery, all in the same amount of time to generate that difference in revenue. Well, the revenue was nice, but what happened to the quality of care? It went down. And so every year in the 80s, when reimbursement started with cataract surgery for two or three or $4,000, Medicare would say, we're going to drop that 10%. So the next year, if you were a cataract surgeon doing 1,000 cases per year, and Medicare cuts you 10%, but you wanted to grow next year 10%, you got to make a 20% difference. That meant the time you had in the exam lane that was 12 minutes, it's now going to be 10 minutes. Next year, it's going to be eight minutes. And so the late 90s, I mean, it was where cataract surgeons would walk into a, an exam lane, spend a minute or two, and, and get a patient scheduled for surgery. The quality of medicine, I'm not a doctor, in my opinion, was not good. It was just massive flow through, and it, I, I didn't think it was a good thing. Today, you can a, a young surgeon can see fewer patients, spend more time, do better education, and then have a higher service fee for their product, and the patient's happy to pay it. So the quality of medicine goes up. So that's what we try and market today is that surgeons can work less, educate more. Patients are, are happier. The revenue stream is there. It's a better way to practice medicine. I think every specialty should have a component like that to improve the quality because there's so many specialties that don't have that ability. They get a fixed flat fee paid by Medicare or private insurance, and they're trapped. They're enslaved by the federal government on what they can be paid. It's like if you tell an attorney, we're going to pay you the same fee per hour that you were receiving in 1995 because we control the government and private insurance. They peg their prices off what the government reimburses. They have controlled what doctors and hospitals and surgical centers are paid ever since I can remember. So the reality is in cataract surgery, I came out in 1997. Cataract surgery is was paid the same amount in the year 2019 as it was paid in 1997. So think about if an attorney or a plumber or an electrician or the price of gasoline or the minimum wage or the, the, the hourly wage that you pay a software engineer remain flat for 20 plus years. Well, then in the year 2020, um, Medicare cut reimbursement, cut it an additional 15%. They're going to cut it again in 2021. So for all of healthcare, it impacts everything because all the doctors are now under pressure. They're all getting a paid decrease. So how are they gonna how are they gonna survive? Are they gonna give their staff a pay cut? Most staff don't like that. Most staff don't find that palatable. They go to work in other businesses that will give them an increase to at least offset the price of inflation or their rent in their 
apartment doesn't generally go down year by year. It tends to go up. So the cost of living only goes up. I don't know how medicine survives with these pay cuts. So elective medicine is it's your lifeline. It's freedom. And that's we're very fortunate in ophthalmology and some other specialties are very fortunate. But I think for the young doctor who wants to come out, be aware that the government controls you and you may want to save the world, but you're you're in so many ways being controlled by um, politicians. It's not a good thing. No, right. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah, we're very fortunate. When the, so when the CMS ruling allowed a surgeon to charge additional fees for these advanced products that patients obviously enjoy and, and in a higher quality of vision, to me, it was, it was a genius move. It's, Freedom. It, it, yeah, yeah it, it, it makes the practice money. It saves the government money. It preserves the system. And the, benefit, the true benefit is the patient. If the patient wants that lens, if the patient wants that Lexus, that Tesla, that, that's how life is. It's, that's why I call it it's retail ophthalmology because you can buy at any level you want to. And thank goodness that now finally the, the technology is, is walking the walk. It used to be we're going to talk the talk about what this lens, what, what laser can do. But our outcomes today, the, the patient satisfaction today, I mean, this is my 32nd year. It's, it, there's never been a better time to be a patient considering LASIK, presbyopia correction, cataract surgery, glaucoma therapy, retinal, you know, whatever. It's, it's so, but that's only because, I think a lot of that's because the government now allows surgeons to charge patients additional for products and services that they couldn't before. So, and, and, and look what it's done to ophthalmology. They should take ophthalmology and compare it to every other specialty. And say, so you want to preserve, you want to give the patient what they need. You want to give the surgeons what, what they need, allow them to invest in their own. And who better to invest in the, the stock market or your practice? That's, that's medicine today and the future. Whether we like it, understood it or not, retail ophthalmology is here. It's a very good thing. I wish you would go to the entire world of medicine and healthcare. Yes. That way everybody could enjoy the benefits. All the patients would benefit because they'd get their competition would enter the market and they'd get a better service. They'd have doctors who go, Hey, if I Medicare, you can cut me, you can cut me as much as you want. But if I can charge a little bit extra for some extra value added service that I can provide, then I'll actually be more incentivized to provide that better level of service and care. Patients will value it. I won't burn out getting my pay cut or flat for a 25 year period. My staff will want to stay with me because I can retain them because I can charge more for better service. The patient gets better care. It's a win, 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 but who knows? The, the model works. <laughs> it, it, it just, uh, it does. Uh, so that's um, so I was gonna say that you know the thinking back about your practice in particular on the you know the marketing component of ophthalmology and, and what your practice was your practice was not like any other practice I was, um, so when I when we joined when I started working together became a partner you had. Two locations or three? I think just just two. We had two. We, and we yeah. looked at your demographics, where patients were coming from. And they were coming from centric circles around each location. I think it was five to ten miles. That was really where patients were coming from. And and you had at the same time I was learning, you guys were introducing laser cataract surgery at the time. And I knew that we had this window to introduce it to the public. And so we, we decided that, okay, let's, let's take this, let's, let's, let's benchmark. Where do patients come from now? What are we spending now on marketing? Let's introduce new marketing techniques that broaden the boundaries of where patients can come from. And let's look at what happens at the end of our, our, our benchmark period. And I remember how that you start getting patients from, as opposed to five miles out, 10 miles out, 15 miles out. And so we started to see early on that patients were coming from as far away as broadcast media 
took your message. We had learned early on, and it's good for ophthalmologists to know that patients will drive X distance for an eye exam. They will drive X times two, three, four, five, six for surgical services. So we knew that as far, I mean, I think now you have patients coming as far as 30, 40, you know, I don't know where your patients come from now, but we learned that if you provide patients just basic information about a service that can now help them, they'll come. And the beauty of, I think, another part of the business of medicine that I think we have to give the government some credit for is that the government now allows people, if you're not, if you're not with an insurance, but you can go anywhere you want to for eye surgery, basically. That's a beautiful thing. Because I mean, if you're a practice like yours who were progressive in introducing new technology, patients can come here. And they, and they did. They've come from, from, from very far away. We've seen the same thing for other practices. I remember you know, Dr. Mann in Houston. We were looking at, at models. How far, how many, how many practices do I need in Houston to, for, to, to secure the eye exam business? And then how far can I take that out 30, 40, 50 miles to capture the surgical business? That's why today Mike Mann has 15 or 20 locations. Dr. Berkeley, his practice, has 22 or 23 locations. Uh, they're just entry points. And now we market across the city. Uh, but the business is new technology, get it to the public, see how they respond, and they, and they come in. What's the mindset of the physician leaders in those practices that uh, want to grow and have like a like the, the man eye practice or like uh, the Berkeley eye practice, multiple, multiple locations, hundreds and hundreds of staff. Um, what's the mindset there? So there, those, I have more respect for those people because I'm a business owner, you're a business owner, you know if we have 20 locations and 400 employees, what that monthly payroll is like and what you have to do you know, every month to feed that, that monster. So there are only so many practices in the country who have those number of locations and practices and, and those things. And that, that mindset is a different mindset of anyone I've ever seen because it's, it's, the good news is they have a, a fixed quality of medicine and they have a, a, their passion is fixed about what they want to do, how they want to do that and how they want to share it. So their mindset is there's, I don't see any fear. They say, and even today, we're the, I still work with Berkeley Eye Center. Uh, they're still acquiring and opening new, because they know if we keep our model, the quality, the processes, the surgical outcomes, and the, and the, and the input you know, here, and the, it will be the same. It'll be like opening up a Starbucks. So they're, they were like the early Starbucks people. They said, we're not gonna change the quality. We're going to keep the same. It may, may be a different surgeon, a different optometrist. And, and those, those two people in particular, Berkeley and Mann, were one of the first ones to utilize optometry in ophthalmology. That was frowned upon. Yes, Dr. Berkeley, he was not well liked by the, the, uh, the medical society because they were using optometrists for in ophthalmology. So, but the model worked very well. So the mindset I saw with those people, no fear. We, we have a practice, we have an outcome, we, we love what we do, we're going to that market, we're gonna open up, and it's worked every single time. How do they maintain consistency of quality, the culture, the communication, such that it's, it's seamless because you're spread so over such a large geographic region? Yeah, so, they, so let's look at Berkeley, for instance. They hire very carefully. They hire, so the surgeon still is the, is the is the leader as the pod leader for that demo, for that let's say they're going to West Houston and Katy or North Houston or the Woodlands you know they they what I saw Berkeley doing and I don't think they'd mind me sharing this is that they were for a while they were hiring a lot of ex military surgeons very experienced surgeons they understand regimen they understand strategy they understand quality of care they 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 know chain of command and so when they come on board. They know they're not, they have a role to play. They're going to try and build something and, and, and they're competitive for the most part. And, and so they've just been real careful on who they hire. 
Uh, Do they to, have one doctor that <clears throat> manages a region in yes, the in the yes. in the Houston metropolitan area? Right. And another doctor magic manages another region. Another, Is that yes, how that works? and that's overseen. By, yeah, wow. so for instance. Dr. Brent McQueen in Kingwood, Brent McCall, he, and then he's in uh, an Aggie, a high, great family. Uh, Dr. McCauley, former military, handles the Woodlands. Dr. Doe and Katie, former military officer, handles Katie. Um, I mean, they're, they're, so everyone in, for Berkeley has their own location. And then they're also their own profit centers. And so they know there's a mothership, and the mothership, and there's a, there's a culture. And they know a, a certain way to to to, uh, to treat patients, and uh, but they're individual profit centers, and they report on a monthly basis, and so it's, that becomes a competition in itself. And I think they knew that. I think they knew, as opposed to having ten surgeons in one building, and they're all kind of seeing patients, whatever. They would give these 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 surgeons their own territory and their own building, uh, but it's 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 your you're under our umbrella, but it's your it's your practice. And that I think is, is has been good for surgeons to really have that that uh, independence, but have the umbrella say, "I get, I've got some partners here that I, you know, that I need." So, and and Dr. Mann's done the same thing, but I don't see anymore. I see more the larger practices are doing it through private equity. They're they're acquiring other ophthalmic practices, but I don't think even in Austin there's a, there's a there's no ophthalmic practice that has 20 locations. What do you think of private equity? What do you think is going to happen with that? Uh, I, so I've been through private equity once with PRG, the Physicians Resource Group, and it failed miserably. Everyone, the good thing for surgeons is you, you all got your practices back, and you all, you, I don't know, you probably weren't in it, but you got your practice back, you got your ASC back. You got, you, if you cashed out early, it was a, a, a financial windfall. I think today that it's a it's a it's a more structured, a more sound you know environment, private equity, and I think that um, uh, I don't I don't know how the long term private equity is going to work because I see practices who are part of private equity and and they're growing, but it seems like that that they are acquiring these practices for the most part to only sell again. So I think for the, a sixty year old surgeon who sells his practice for a, an eight to 12 multiple and has a three year earnout? that's a phenomenal opportunity. I, I, know, I know surgeons who are 68 and 70 who are being bought out by private equity. They come in and they, 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 pri private equity has the money to bring in other, other staff and other doctors to keep that practice alive. So if you got a good brand, uh, that works. What, what doesn't work to me is that when you, when you buy a practice and the practice is not growing at ten percent, you know, annually. I don't know how the ultimate payoff. So who gets what private equity group gets caught holding the 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 they call it the the, the bite of the the, the second, second bite, bite on the apple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If 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 I buy you for a ten multiple, we build a we put it all together, and then you, we sell that for another eight or ten multiple. Now we've got somebody's got twenty multiples to 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 try and generate profit from from the same group. So. If I were a, a private practice and private equity was approaching me, I would just be real careful who that partner was. There are some phenomenal groups out there that, that seem to want to kind of hold and grow, and that, that's solid. There are others who, who grow, acquire, sell. And it depends on, again, your age. We've had some clients who are in their 40s. They, they've sold, and they're, they're very happy with their, with their private equity partners. Uh, the, so the issue we were seeing early on in ophthalmology was the young guys coming out of medical school who finished their residency and their fellowships and whatever they join a practice, they're there two or three or four years. It's time to buy in for two, three, four million dollars to the practice. They don't have it. They've got school debt. They've got medical school debt. They've got home debt. They've got, they're married now. And so, so it was, it was becoming difficult for certain partners to, to for doctors to become a partner. Private equity comes along. And, and has another alternative. So I think private equity is is a good thing for some of ophthalmology. I'm not sure it works for everybody. And, and it, I think in another four to six years, we'll see it play out one way or the other. But we've there are some mega practices out there right now. Um, but I, I, I'm only seeing growth through acquisition. Uh, I don't know, there's, there's some economies of scale 
you know, for when you come together, like accounting and legal and purchasing and all those things. But ophthalmology is still ophthalmology. It's we're st- we're still you're still all hourly employees. You can only make as much as much as you can make by how many hours you work. That's 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 fixed. And so I think the future of private equity may be where it will have to be to be profitable that surgeons basically only do surgery. They'll be taken out of most of the other components of, uh, and that may be a, you know, a very efficient, good way to go. I don't know, but as hourly employees, you have to spend more time in the OR going forward to make private equity profitable. Yeah, we'll see. I, yeah. I, I don't have the answer. My, my instinct is that private equity is out for private equity. They're not really out for the patient. They're, they're, they're not connected to the patient and the quality of care in those types of practices would probably not sustain itself as well as it would by a, uh, a group that is more intimately connected to their customer, the, right. the doctor. So I think doctor-owned practices will have a longer survival rate um, and they'll have better relationships with their customers, their patients, than practices that are owned by private equity. That's my theory. We'll see. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, I think it'll, it'll, it'll play out. Uh, refractive surgery. Is refractive surgery the future of ophthalmology? Absolutely. I mean, I, uh, to me, my company is called CRM Group. Initially, it was called the Center for Refractive Marketing. And we had a, it was center with an RE versus ER because I wanted to be international. And I was doing work in Canada. Uh, but I always wanted to be involved in refractive. But back in the 80s, refractive was, you know, it was cutting on healthy corneas. There wasn't any refractive cataract surgery. And so I grew up on, on the word refractive. But I've seen over, you know, since the 80s, all the things that can go wrong with refractive in many ways, like with radiokeratotomy, the hyperopic shift, and then with AK and ALK, the corneas and all, and, and, and all those things. But the future today, technology diagnostics have gotten so much better that refractive surgery today at every level, laser vision correction, you know, presbyopic, you know, correction, cataract surgery, the future is refractive surgery, I think, because it's what patients want. Patients are, especially now during this COVID-19 crisis, patients just don't want good vision. They, they want to be, they want to feel confident they want to feel safe. They want to. They want to have great vision at, at at all times in every lit environment. They don't want to feel vulnerable. And so, refractive surgery has been an eye opener to me, and I, and I think to the public because we've seen it every step. When you tell the public, you know, we have a toric lens now, or you know, we have a laser now, and do this, or we have diagnostics now, or we have this this now, they're all they all lean in a little bit and go, tell me more. And so the more we share it with patients about refractive surgery saying, hey, you don't have to have this, but it's your vision, how you want to see going forward. The good news is we can customize that for, and you can choose any level you want. The, 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 the good news about, about refractive surgery and ophthalmology today is there's no bad news. You take probably the worst cataract surgeon out there or the worst refractive surgeon out there, they're doing a pretty good job. But if you have the basic cataract surgery or ba- anything basic, presbyopic lens exchange, whatever, you're going to get a good result for the most part. It's how we go from there and get better. So to me, the, the future, we're advancing so much with technology and, and patients are learning more and more and more. The patients will soon be demanding. They don't know the word refractive right now, I don't think. Uh, but patients will soon be demanding a level of refractive surgery based on where your practice is today. And that's led us into what I think is the real holy grail of ophthalmology is presbyopia correction. Why is that the holy grail? Because that's where the most, so the future, all the research right now, even more so post COVID says that, that only the people that are presbyopic are the decision makers, have the financial wherewithal, have whatever insurance, have the job, whatever, to have refractive surgery. So people that are in that age group are presbyopic and they've already shown they'll pay privately 
to have their vision corrected. And, you know, the old marketing days were if you if you can't drive at night anymore, or if you have trouble reading this or reading that, you're, you've reached a stage in life where it's probably dangerous for you to be living. I mean, falling down a stair, you know, driving your car in the evening. Okay, come in and have cataract surgery. It's covered by Medicare, you know, whatever. So the days of making patients wait to have refractive surgery or waiting till the cataract is ripe is dangerous, number one. We've always thought that. But number two, we, when patients that are in their 50s that are presbyopic or late 40s, when they hear that, we can now give you a full range of vision, restore your near vision, give you intermediate computer vision, and give you distance vision in your 40s and 50s, and you'll never need cataract surgery, three things happen. You lose dependence on corrective eyewear, number one. Number two, you're saving money by not needing multiple procedures as you age. You have one procedure, one time. You'll never need anything else for the rest of your life, maybe a YAG if we're doing you know, a lens implant procedure. Uh, and number three, you don't, you don't have the health issues that people have later on in life when they wait too long to have their lenses exchanged or have cataract surgery. So pres, presbyopia is, I mean, cor, the correction of presbyopia, people think, well, most doctors didn't promote presbyopia correction because they go, Mike, they don't know what presbyopia means. I kept saying, well, let's just first, let's tell them what presbyopia means, first of all. But, but now people know, as you've seen, Presbyopia means reading glasses. That's pretty easy. And when you tell people, look, we can correct the need for your for your reading glasses and you will never need cataract surgery, they like to hear that. And we and so we say, look, you don't you don't need LASIK, so save that four thousand dollars. You don't need cataract surgery, so we're gonna save that that four thousand dollars later on. So right now you pay let's eight thousand dollars to have presbyopic lens exchange and you're good to go. You're working, you're fifty years old. You feel like you're 35 again. You've got better vision in many cases than you've ever had. People that have been myopic for since they were, you know, high school, junior high, whatever, or they've been wearing reading glasses since, since they were, you know, late 30s, early 40s. It's gone. It's over. There's, I mean, there that the presbyopic crowd understands value, and the value is if you can tell me you can remove all of this and give me this. One time, I pay for it, my choice. And and but but there aren't many surgeons out there that that and I don't know why that are really pursuing passionately the correction of presbyopia. We went through Intex. I I think part of the problem was we had some temporary correction that went on that I was a, a big par marketing part of that. You know, for all those things that, that, that you know, you know the camera and intacts and, and, and raindrop, all the things that were, I guess they were good for its time, but it was temp So I don't think temporary correction of anything is a good, is good in ophthalmology. I think permanent correction is, is a good thing. So you, you were touching on it. Studies show 15% of cataract surgery is done with a premium lens implant that gives full range of focus. Why do you think it's, peaked at 15 percent i think it's peaked at 15 percent because more of the surgeons than of the patients i think there were what's you know, holding these surgeons back i think what holds surgeons some surgeons back let's just let's just say um does that include laser laser cataract surgery or just these are just lenses these are lenses so the study so there's over four million cataract procedures or u.s or worldwide this is in the u.s mm -hmm. annually market scope research well, and I, yeah. they say only 15 percent is something like uh, maybe like yeah receive 15 percent receive a an astigmatism correcting or a presbyopia correcting lens implant and what is going on with these surgeons because it's i think it's limited by the surgeons not the public i think it's absolutely limited by the surgeons and i think that sometimes sir like we had we had surgeons who they were tied to um, this is not an Alcon or a J and J, you know, conversation, but they were tied to a certain pr provider for their FACO, for their for for their packs, for for everything, and so they they were and, and lenses. So a new lens comes out over here, they go, well, we don't we don't do those lenses because we have our our, our deal over here for for everything else, and so so initially it was they wouldn't even look at another lens. So if, if whatever lens came out on either either side, 
a lot of guys were just, they had their lens and they liked their lens. And so I think that initially there were some lens ownership issues. And then I think there were some issues with some of the early multifocal lenses. They were, it was, it was over promised and under delivered. And that was an issue. And I don't know how many great surgeons that I, I work with and saw, they'd have a patient who would tell them, I want this multifocal lens. They'd work them up. They put the multifocal lens in and they'd have glistening or they'd have an issue with their computer. There, 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 there were just post-operative management issues that were driving these surgeons batty. And it just takes one a month. You have one dissatisfied multifocal lens patient. That's all you need to, to keep you from putting in any more multifocal lens implants. So we saw initially, that's why I think we saw more toric lenses more astigmatic correction going on. So we did a, we we're trying to do a better job with educating patients. So now I think what we're going to see, so I think it's limited by the surgeons. I think in the next five years, that number jumps from 20 to 25%. Uh, as the younger groups come in and they understand, the, and you have to understand the limitations of the lenses you're putting in based on patient age. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a surgeon. But I know that, that of all the practices we work with, you guys must do a very good job of managing patient expectations and delivering along those lines. All you have to do from a marketing standpoint is say, we're going to provide you this for this. That's where the perceived value eats our ask, my asking price. And then the outcome. So if, if you tell them a patient what to expect and can deliver that, that's a beautiful thing. So I think that's what every practice has to do a better job of is first of all, manage your, provide realistic expectations, manage those expectations, but deliver the outcome that you told the patient you were going to deliver. If you can't do that, if it's going to be a little bit below, or then, then, then transparency is always the best way, especially with a presbyopic you know, crowd. If you're treating presbyopia, you have to do, and this is where I think the practice of medicine requires a little bit more time uh, for presbyopia correction because you have to understand that patient and really work them up in a, in a way where you go, okay, this this mentally, I think this is a good a patient for this. Mm -hmm. You know, physically, their 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 the health of their eyes, I, I think, is this, and I think I can manage those expectations and deliver the result there. Now, can you do that in seven minutes? Not really. Yeah. So no. So patients think, uh, oh, insurance should cover this. Insurance should cover this. They don't realize it takes an entire process that you have to build. You have to, number one, educate the public. That is a marketing piece that, that involves a cost. Then you have to educate your, your surgeons and your staff, get them on board so they understand how to educate the people who uh, communicate online or over the phone. And once those patients are in the office, we have to have a very clear way of communicating the upside and downside of everything. We don't oversell anything. We always under promise. We tell them this might not be perfect for you. Nothing in life is perfect, but it does work well for the vast majority of patients. Um, patients do perceive the value. And as time has gone by, the technologies keep getting better and better. But I think anybody who's Let's say you're a young ophthalmologist, you're coming out, um, you have to kind of picture your life and the lives of those that you touch over your career, your life, you'll have much more to show for your life um, if you pursue refractive surgery than if you don't, just because your ability to earn a living is going to be better. Um, the patients are going to be receiving the best possible care over your <clears throat> your lifespan. But if your mindset is I, I'm, whether you realize it or you you can overcome your own ego to to have a continuous process of learning and getting better and um, adapting to all these changes that come down, you'll stay kind of plateaued in your career and your patients will receive that same type of plateaued care um i think it's yeah i i think it's it's only gotten better but it's the process that you have to build and how you communicate with patients and how you can manage their expectations on the front end and if they don't do well because not everybody does great how to manage the the patient 
from a optical standpoint, from a, a really a psychological standpoint, <laughs> when they're dissatisfied, and that's been a whole process in a, in and of itself. But yeah, with, for example, like we used to charge a lower fee for a, like a premium lens, and then we would charge the patient if we had to retreat them. We tell them up front, oh, you, there's a ten percent chance you're going to need a retreatment. And we'd get them to sign off on that in writing before surgery. We disclose everything, and then when it came to that group who ended up in the ten percent that needed the retreatment, they were furious. And we said, "Well, you, you did sign the form. We educated you, and we charged you less. Now we're just going to charge you a small fee to retreat you." They did not have anything to do no, with it. So we fought that battle for for a long time. Finally, we just said, "We're just going to have a buffet plan. We're going to charge one fee." And whatever happens, happens, and we'll manage uh, we'll manage things, and we'll absorb the cost. It's just our goal is just get you happy as the end result. That tends to work better. But you have to have people who are willing to manage that and listen to it. And maybe some doctors just they don't want to deal with those people. But then they those doctors choose the grind. They choose living in the world of insurance they choose to be enslaved by medicare and and whatever they get paid they get paid they can they can have their stagnant uh salary for for their 30-year career um i i don't see how they can live with that that's just i mean we're americans we like freedom right right I, so and that's what refractive surgery offers freedom um Right. Yeah, I think you hit on a, you hit on a good point because when you say marketing, the marketing of medicine and marketing of ophthalmology, a lot of people think the external component to that. A lot of the marketing is what you guys have shown takes place in the practice. Right. It's that's how you build value. It's not so much through the external things that we do. It's internally. It's how you prepare that patient, how you educate that patient, and the process that goes through and the time that you spend. So that. That's, that's as equally, if not more important, because I think a patient is not going to have or pay for a refractive procedure unless they feel totally confident, totally educated, and understand you know, their outcome. And that doesn't happen without a lot of internal marketing processes going on in place. Right. Marketing just gets them to contact our office. It's what we do with it that makes the right. difference. Ex and if we don't connect with the patient... And we don't educate them. They don't feel like they, they get a vibe that's unusual or kind of shady. They won't They won't do it. I, right. I, I think all patients are smart. And I think anybody who tries to kind of um, oversell something or kind of assume that patients can be sold something, I think they're asking for trouble. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I agree. Um I was going to ask you that, you know, we talked about, you know, you were just Shannon Wong when you first began your practice, but you said through marketing, you've seen a difference in the exam lane. When you walk in, is it true that you feel, do you feel that marketing has given you a bit of an edge, an advantage with the patient? Like they feel like they might know you and perhaps even trust you a little bit more when, because now you're getting patients that aren't, you know, referred by friends and family or an OD or whomever. Do you think your marketing has given you uh, the opportunity now to where patients go, oh, that, I, I know, I think I, like they feel better about, about you as a doctor before they've even met you. Is that possible? It, and is that? It's because of your great editing skills with the video. <laughs> no, you do make us look good. And so that builds a relationship. Uh, that starts before we ever meet them, which is very effective. For I mean, it, it marketing does work. Uh, the value of that being, you think it it increases their perceived value before they walk in the door, or yeah, do they'll you? say, "Oh, you seemed likable," or "I I could tell I liked you based on what I when I saw this," and then they'll quickly qualify it. They'll say. But I don't just take the commercial. I've done some research. Uh, and so they'll have, they'll have asked friends or they'll have gone online yeah. or whatever. So they 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 dig a little deeper. Um, yeah, most people, I, yeah, I don't think people just take one point of contact and then make a decision. Right, they, right. They, 
they do their homework a little bit. Yeah, we're seeing that uh, online, like digital marketing, for instance, we, we do what's called A-B split testing. So we'll put, you know, a 48-year-old presbyopic woman out for an ad uh, talking about presbyopia correction, laser lens replacement, whatever. Then we put a doctor in a white lab coat saying breakthrough and reading glasses, surgical techniques or something. Then we want to, who, who performs better? We're seeing doctors in white lab coats almost always outperform a, a non-medical person, you know, on, on digital social type, because I think it's, it's believability, it's educational. I'm not being sold by a pretty face. Um, so now you're, so you're like, now you're seeing like in Texas, especially these attorneys that are, that are, that are on television themselves. They don't have another person speaking for them. I think that there's there's value in sharing doctors with the public in any way there is to build that that confidence. And so when they do come in, they yeah. So hopefully, yeah, the, you make the doctors look uh, approachable and likable and oh, that's trustworthy. But that that's, I mean, not all people uh, can are fortunate enough to have that vibe. And right. I see commercials of other medical providers and uh, I Who still wouldn't be. I still wouldn't go right. to see them but maybe that's because the production's not right maybe the sound quality maybe the lighting's not right maybe they weren't prepped uh, oh you got to wear this or that or you got to comb your hair or mm -hmm. whatever they look a little even the vibe I get with them is uh is, is something's not quite right there right and so I still wouldn't go see them yeah um uh, it's, a, it's a good point because it's your it's your reputation. And so we've always been, it's, it's worked as a team by what does the public really want to hear? What do we, what would we like to say as a surgical practice? And how can we present that in a method where they're going to embrace it? If you don't do that properly, it's like having the wrong surgical process. It's, now, it's more damaging. No, we use TV. And we don't use that much social media. What do you think? How effective is social media for marketing healthcare, in your opinion? So, the so I think social media is like and um, the the topping to to marketing. Yeah, social media I don't think will ever be enough on its own to do what we do in Austin or what we do in Houston with the with the with the with the larger practices. If you look at television, so we, for our, our business, all transparency, our fees are fixed. No one's paying us to run television or to run radio or to do pay Google search. I mean, our fees are the same no matter what we do. So we don't have a particular reason for wanting to do television or wanting to do Google paid search or wanting to do Instagram. We do whatever works for the target audience we're chasing. Um, so what we've seen is that after your married, have kids, settled in life, buy your house, you get into a routine. And the routine has been for years, uh, 40, age 40 to 50 on, you have viewing habits around a television. There's an audience there. So we say, okay, if we want to deliver an audience to this age message or that age group or this age, how do we get there most efficiently, most effectively, including cost? Well, if you watch TV, you see Apple on promoting Apple products on television. If it was all social media, you would never see Apple. You know, you wouldn't see AT and T only promoting on, on on Facebook or social media. They're all over television because television has the biggest still the the law and, and right now, especially COVID, post COVID, whatever viewership is is skyrocketing. We watch things like this is an election year, Trump and Biden viewership for. 50 year olds plus never higher. Uh, so we like television, not because I make a dime more. It's because if you do it right, it's proven that it will effectively get your message to an audience that will respond in a certain way to your message. If it's appropriate. If you, let's say you have a practice and I bet you have these types of practices that go, I don't do surgery for lens replacement or cataract surgery i just do lasik and ha and you must steer those people i guess to 
online stuff, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and then how effective is it? And what kind of message? What? How effective is it? So multimedia is what we do. So with social media, digital media, so if with LASIK, for instance, the number one place to be, period, online versus Facebook, Instagram, wherever else, you have to be on paid search. Only There's only one place on the web where people actively search for something. That's in one of the search engines. So if you're going to market LASIK, you have to be in paid search. Google owns 85% of that paid search. So you pretty much have to be somewhere where people are searching for, for that product. So with LASIK, we say, look, you got to be in paid search. So everybody else, then, there, then there's, there's um, display advertising, which is if online, if they allow a banner ad to show up, we serve up a banner ad. You could be searching for a condo in Florida, but over here on the right side is a banner ad for how LASIK can change your life. Uh, that's So that's a secondary level down from, from active paid search. We also like retargeting. Retargeting is remarketing. If people go to your website, most people are there for under two minutes. They leave. If you don't have retargeting in place in the right pixels, you have no way to communicate with them saying, hey, you were at our site. Here's a little reminder about what we do here whether it's refractive lens exchange, you know, whatever it is. So that's that's retargeting. So so paid search, retargeting, you know, display ads. Yes, you got to do all that. Now on to Facebook. I mean, Facebook and Instagram are so affordable now. It's a good place to be. But you're only getting to people that, that may be interested in, at some point, having LASIK. What we like to do in, in a, with multimedia is... is include at least one traditional method. So right now we're testing getting, so we're, we've been off media for two months for most of our clients. And now, and because no one's been going to work, we haven't done a thing with radio or broad, broad the extension traditional media. The governor of Texas opened up phase one two weeks ago. We were on the radio with a, with a texting message. People say radio, radio. People still listen to radio. People still watch television. It's boring. People still use direct mail. So we launched, this, we launched two radio campaigns. The Monday the governor opened the state, said you can go back to work for 25% of the people. We, use t we only do radio with text messaging because how do you track radio? Well, you really can't. But if, 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 if your message says text clear to 474747 and it's only on radio, every single text message you get to 474 can be related back to radio. So if you spend $10,000 and you get, like in Houston, in the first week we're back on radio, we had nearly 400 text messages from a week of radio. And it, there's no other way to, to, to even hear the message. And so then we have to process those text messages. But we like, and then what happens is, like, like you and I, if we're in our car or we're watching television and we see a message, most of us don't have a pen in our hand writing down numbers from the TV or from radio. What do we do? We go online and we search. And so I think that practices who are serious, you have to have a broad message out there that reminds people, oh, LASIK, oh, laser lens replacement, oh, you know, multifocal this, you know, presbyopia that. I'll go learn more at that website. But, the, but our, our, so every month we're putting out new messaging broadly to filter back into, you know, the whatever message online we're trying to discern. So then that gets into budgeting. Okay, what do you charge for your procedure? People go, man, that's a lot of money to be spending on television or radio. I go, oh, let's let's back up. So let's look at cost per lead. If I'm going to co-manage a cataract patient with an optometrist, the cost per lead basically is four hundred dollars. If you co-manage my patient with me, optometrist, I'm going to pay you four hundred dollars, and for that. I get the patient and you get $400. There's no brand building awareness. So people always ask me, Mike, would you rather have 100% OD referred practice or would you rather have 100% marketing practice? Now, I'm a marketing person, but I say it, that's that's a no brainer. I'd rather have a practice if they're equally successful and the, the same surgical volume, I'd rather get it through advertising and marketing because you have a brand you've built. If you have it all through optometric and you, and you lose a portion or all of your optometric partners, for some reason, you're out of business. You're too dependent. It's the same cost per lead. 
So longevity, brand, whatever, it's always cheaper and better to market than be solely on, on co-management. So we look at, okay, look, what are our costs for the procedure? It's X, okay. How many of those do I need to pay for the media? Okay, that's going to be Y. So, all right, I need eight bilateral patients to pay for this month's media. We put the processing, tracking methods in place. What's our conversion on this spin down to uh, a, a person, a body in an exam lane chair that ends up going into surgery? That's X. So it's metrics marketing. We spend, we convert, we monitor, we do surgery. Cost for that surgery times how many do we have in this funnel typically is four to one, six to one, 10 to one based on your price for your product. So if you're watching your spend and making sure you're converting down, the media is irrelevant. We just happen to like like TV and radio because it gets a lot more messages down into the, the funnel. And then we process them out. You think those are more powerful for the younger, let's say younger than 40 crowd than, um, than Facebook, Instagram, social media, that kind of stuff? Again, it's, it's, an, it's an eight cylinder engine. Um, the, the TV and cable uh, streaming, um, I'm now doing, I've, I've, I'm a cable cutter. We just cut our cable about a, a month ago. And I'm going, wow, this is pretty nice. It's about a fourth of the cost. And there's, but there's still commercials on there. So, it, so that medium, because you pay less, and then the younger generation is all about, they used to be all about travel and spending money on experiences and not spending money on cable television and those things. So they'll, they'll take on free digital streaming things that allow commercials. I think this younger, this next generation will be all about, like we were, have been on, on TV for seniors, broad TV. I think you start scaling back down to digital streaming those partners. I'm seeing those commercials, and that's a whole different set of commercials that I'm seeing now that are on streaming. But I, I, I think, though, there's so much. We are becoming a visual society. Everything we do, for the most part, is on a, on a, a screen somewhere. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. unless your marketing message is on someone's screen somewhere, mm-hmm. you know, and so, yeah, will it, will, it, will it evolve? Will TV and radio continue to probably dwindle down yes and then there's there's satellite radio there's you know there are different kinds of uh, but i think there's always going to be a need for a broader delivery method that comes down to a funnel based on on cost so what do you what is a common theme with the ophthalmologist that you work with the most common theme i see with ophthalmologists is that they want to do surgery. I, I've never what surgery makes them happy, and there's never a number that that they that they they go okay that's enough. Which hey that's what you you're trained to to race a car or you're trained to, to operate on an eye. Surgeons love to do that, and so what I've seen with our clients is that it, so it's in a way it's not sad it's just reality. Life in ophthalmology is a number. And we have to be careful. And, I, and, I, and I, I give this talk a lot about it's a very repetitive business. I'm sure every one of your Mondays is like the previous Monday. And every one of your Thursdays. And, Fridays, and so there's a process. And, and what I hear a lot from, from, from tech managers and from practice managers and even surgeons and optometrists is, how many do we have this morning? And how many do we have this afternoon on the schedule? And then that's for the, that's for the, the, the clinic. Then they'll say, how many do we have on the books for Tuesday, how many do we have on the books for Thursday? So it's 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 numeric. So ophthalmology is becoming numerical in terms of numbers. Numbers equal, uh, you know, a, a service level, and that equals practice revenue. Gets back to the business of medicine. So 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 absolutely, it's a repetitive business. It's a numerical business. And what I've seen the the theme among all surgeons is I love to do surgery. You can probably not feed me too much surgery, and if you do, I'll hire another person to help you feed, you know, that that surgical. Um, so that's that's the first thing I've seen, and I think they. And the second thing I've seen is when I ask every surgeon, I'll say, "What day is more fun for you, the day of surgery or the day after surgery, the post-op?" And I'm telling you, I don't care how. Now at some point, these guys get so busy and so big they don't even see their post-ops, and I get that. 
But at some point, they were seeing post ops, and they still like to see their post ops. They will say, "I'm not sure who's happier on one day, me or the patient," because I mean, to, it's like cutting your grass. You cut the grass; it's it's gratification because you see you see it. You see your patient the next day. They've gone from twenty whatever to twenty whatever, and you've done that. I mean, there's not many there's not many specialties or opportunities in life. I'll never have that opportunity. Never. I will never know that feeling that someone says to you, thank you. This is, you, you didn't just change their vision. You've changed their life. So that, I've seen that as much, sometimes they don't want to do that Saturday morning post-op or their Friday whatever post-op, but, but running theme, they love, surgeons love post-ops and surgeons love doing surgery. And I haven't found the magic number, but I, want to, but I say, I'll tell the technicians, I do a talk. And I'll play a video, and it's the theme song from uh, Gladiator. And it's the music, and it's just music, and it's th- from the very end. And it's um, and I and, I, and the title of this, the title of this video is "Let Us Not Forget," and it's all about it's thirty clips of of four second sound bites, and the patients will say, "This is the best thing I've ever done. This has changed my life. I can't thank you enough." This is incredible. It's this, it's that, and the music is crescendoing, and his patients are. This is, I mean, it's the best investment I've ever made. I can't put a price on this. This is priceless. It's so. So then I play that video Monday morning. When you tell me how many do we have this morning, I'll say you've got forty five. So you got to hook them this morning, but don't forget what what this is all about. It's about what's going to happen after you see those forty five. That's why we're here, and that's why you can't get hung up in. So that's that's the surgical practice side. Here's the sad side of what can happen. I've seen a lot. I go to Connecticut. I'm in this practice, and they see three or four hundred patients a day. It's a massive in one location. They got surgeons everywhere, pods everywhere, and patients come in. And I said, they said, I said, well, the first thing I want to do is I want to sit with a patient. I want to follow them through to see your flow. So I'm over in diagnostics. And this guy, he, everybody has to go through the eye of the needle, the diagnostics. And there's, there's six or eight machines in there. And so we're doing that. And I'm with this lady and she's 80 years old or 84. And her, her daughter is 64. And I'm thinking the daughter's there for cataract surgery. She says, no, I'm here with, for my mother. I said, oh, hi, I'm Mike. Nice to meet you. And I said, I said, I said, tell me what's, I said, man, she looks like she's all, all dressed up. Tell me about you and your mom a little bit before we get, before this. She goes, she goes, oh man. She goes, she says, mom and I, mom's 84. She's in assisted living. I've got, you know, I'm in the kids are finally getting ready to get out of the house, college. It's crazy. So mom can't get out much anymore. I don't see mom much anymore. Mom and I don't even go grocery shopping anymore. But she said, let me tell you. She says on her calendar a month ago, she circled this day, you know, eye doctor appointment, cat possible cataract surgery. So, and she, and for four weeks, mom's been waiting for this day. This morning, mom gets up. It's God's truth. Puts on lipstick for the first time. Fixes her hair. Puts on her, you know, nice Nice her clothes. Daughter, she's waiting for her daughter. Daughter comes, picks her up. I mean, and they come to the clinic. And we're seeing three or 400 patients that day. And I'm with her. And so I watch her. They bring her back. And they start to do the head shoving. Hold still. Put your head right there. Hold still. Put your head right there. Boom, boom. Nobody asks her, how you doing? You look nice today. What hobbies do you have? It's just this process. And then... We go back in the di- in the dilating area, and then we get dilated for thirty minutes. Then we go back and we wait thirty minutes to see one of the doctors. And then she's now it's about eleven forty five, and she's still got 10, 12 patients to see before her lunch. And then she got starts at one. So the numerical thing is taking over. And I'm sitting with this woman. I'm waiting for someone to go. Let's let's get personal. Let's 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 earn this day that was on her calendar. You know. They get emotional because it's just it's true. And so the surgeon walks in and she um, works patient up and says, okay, I think you need cataract surgery. And I want you to go down and see, you know, the scheduler and she'll, she'll take care of you. 
And so she walks out. And I'm thinking of my mom, your mom, you know, whoever mom. So we walk out. And uh, I said, uh, she said, who, who do you work with? I said, well, I have my own company. I, I was too embarrassed to say that I'm here. I've worked for this, for this company right here. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm sorry. I said, you know, this, this is, it wasn't the way I wanted it to go. And uh, the good news is you're going to do very well in their hands. I said, but I'm here to change this a little bit so that you get a better understanding of what they're doing and all this. So, so we ended it at noon. And, and she leaves and she signs up for surgery and I'm sure that it's fine. Well, at noon, I've got a one hour presentation prepared for these 300 people and all the surgeons. And so, I'm not sure, this is my first time there, like you and your dad at, that, at dinner at Fleming's. I'm not sure how I'm gonna open this thing up. But I opened up, I said, um, I said, hey, I'm Mike Malley, I'm from Texas and y'all didn't even know I was here today, but I, I went through with Mrs. Jones today. I said, you wanna hear about Mrs. Jones? and and they go, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're all excited. We're, they're having pizza and they're all excited. And I said, this is this is who she is. This was her daughter. This is what she spent the last month preparing for. And this is pretty much how you guys treated her today. And I stopped. And I didn't say another word for maybe 30 seconds. I just kind of looked around. I wasn't crying or anything. <laughs> and um, and I said, I said, that's why I'm here. I said, there's a way to do this where we do a much better job because right now, you know, 75% of your patients come from satisfied other patients. And, and, and you guys are gonna charge this, this woman, she's 84 years old, $4,000 bilateral for, for toric lens implants, you know? And I just think that she deserves better. If my mom came here, if your mother came here, if your aunt came here, your sister came here, we, do, we, just, we have to do a better job. Now I get we're all employees, and I get you see three or 400 patients a day, but, from a, from a marketing education standpoint, we can do a much more informative, educational, sharing job and listen than, than, than we did today. And they go, of course, then the surgeons chime in. You know, hey, we don't have a lot of time to listen. And I just happen to have a, uh, another video. It's a game I play. There are four second clips. Some of them are taken from your practice. Some are taken from Thermo and I Associates in the Valley. Some are taken from Houston. I interview patients like I did with your patients early on. And at some, at some point I'll ask them, what, what do you like to do most? And they'll say, oh, I'm, I like to woodwork. Or I like to, one of your guys is in the video. He's the, mar, he's the motorcycle guy that we, and we filmed at your dad's house. Mm -hmm. So I play these, I said, I get it doctor. I, I know that your time is, is critical and you don't have a lot of time to, to listen. I said, but we all have four or five seconds, okay? I said, all you need is five seconds. I said, I'm going to play these clips, and you tell me what that patient is most passionate about talking about. And then, so I'd, I'd play this guy. I would say, um, your guy says, I work on motorcycles. I drive motorcycles. They're my life. I stopped. I said, what, what kind of vision does he need? They go, oh, he needs, he needs I said, when you're, when you're working on a, on a spark plug, you got to have near vision. But he said, also, ride motorcycles he needs distance so the guy's perfect multifocal that's all you got to know about you want to ride your motorcycle and work on it man let me let me tell you something we have a lens now that's available that i think can give you perfect vision that you're gonna be able to do all that and get back to your riding and your motorcycle another lady works on flowers another one does knitting so it's all four seconds so i said i'm just telling you guys you have four seconds this is their day it's not your day because it's a Monday and you've got 40 or 50. It's their day. Give them their day. You've paid me money to generate them to get them here somehow. OD co-management, marketing, advertising, Google, whatever. We've paid to get them here. Give them their day. And it's usually, I said, look, all I want, I don't want every day. I don't want every post-op. I don't want a glaucoma pressure check. You know, I want the, the vision correction first eye day. That's the day that I want. That's the day they're, they, they've they earned. Because second eye, what do they all say? Man, doc, you did so great on the first eye. I want the same thing for the second eye. You know, but it's that first eye. And I'll say, well, you know, how big a thing is this? Patients will say, outside of marriage, buying my first house, or having children, what you're doing for me is is top five, 
Top five stuff. Does a orthopedic surgeon get that? I don't think so. Does a plumber, electrician, accountant, does President Trump get no? Top five. And and when I and I say, and you let them burn through here without even asking them what they do? Are they still driving? Well, you know, how do they use their vision? Whatever. So that's that's you know the part where if nobody in this podcast gets anything else from a marketing standpoint, if they can just give patients, first eye patients, their day, work, mold your day around that. If you got to speed up everywhere else, then so be it. But that first day, first eye, so important for so many reasons. That's where the magic happens, in my opinion. Yeah, that's, um, that's the art yeah. of medicine. Um, that's why, even though we'll, we'll see how long we keep our masks on, I hate the mask. Because you, everybody's in, a bank robber in the office, the doctor and the patient, the staff, we're all, we can't identify... We can't identify who's who. Uh, so I walk in the room. First thing I do is I take off my mask and go, hi, nice to meet you. And I put it back on because I'm supposed Good for to. Yeah, that's well. Wow. But you, you can't connect with people. Um, and we talked about private equity. They're, they're going to lead. They're going to contribute to this depersonalization process. They'll all be about the bottom line. They're, they're about numbers and not so much the human factor and what i've learned over time is that any any organization that is going to do well they're going to have to have very good leadership and so when you describe that practice i mean to me the that's lack of or uh maybe the the leaders the physician leaders in that group the staff is um, kind of representing the values of the physician leaders in the organization. And so those physician leaders need to be made aware of, and hopefully they'll care enough to modify their approach so they, their staff kind of reflects the ethos of their personality, the goodness of, of the leadership to each patient so they create a better experience. Um, and I, I can tell when I walk into a practice immediately – by meeting the staff, I can almost tell what the surgeon is going to be like. Mm. Number one, number and so. What's nice about the Connecticut team is that I think they realized that they 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 brought me in because they were. It's a it's a monster practice, and I think that and some of the younger they happen to be women uh, surgeon partners. They're the ones that that wanted that culture and wanted that educational and one and all the things, and so I think that. I salute them for for realizing. Yeah, I mean, do they need me? Do they need to be told how to run? You know, how to do a more personal job of running their practice? No, but but do they want it? I think they I think they do, and, it, and it's it's one of the hardest things to do is to is to build a busy business and and deliver that personal touch that the staff sees, and then they embrace, and then it, it goes right down. But I I can walk into certain practices. And know that, wow! Wait till I meet this surgeon. I, I know what it's going to be like. And others, I walk in, and you know, the the, the exact opposite. It the, the practice culture it takes on the person, whether the surgeons and the partners realize it or not, they take on that that personality. And you got to be careful. And I think that there's a lot of practices, you know, like like the you know I keep saying Berkeley, but a lot of our practices, they. They they just run and it's nice and it's quality and it's it's high pro- it's, and um, very professional. But it's just I think it's happened because there's good people in the right places that have a good culture. And I mean you've you've hired good people here. You, I mean it's it's just but it's that's one of the hardest things in business to do is because when it's not right, I've seen a lot of those partnerships. There's been a lot of names on buildings in ophthalmology that were that were two names that became one name. It just didn't work. I mean, things like, you know, it, like we talked about Berkeley, man first, and then Berkeley. T- separately, phenomenal. Put them together, it was two different cultures because you've all of a sudden got, so there's there's type A personalities, there's leadership. I mean, imagine if there was 
two Donald Trumps in the White House. There'd be friction there. And maybe it's better if they're in two wings of the White House. Why would two type A personalities want to come together to begin with? Because that's probably not a great combination. They knew early on that that they could capture, if, if they came together, they could capture the entire Houston market from a provider standpoint. And that that was their that was their goal. That we're both doing, we both have strong brands. Man actually had a had a a, a stronger brand than Berkeley because Berkeley was Houston Eye Clinic. Then they became Berkeley Eye Center, and then uh, and then they became Man Berkeley Eye Center. Uh, and and to this day, people still say they, they still think Man Berkeley Eye Center because we did so much marketing of Man Berkeley Eye Center. But it, they were smart enough both those practices to realize they were they were better separately, and that's that that can be a good thing too. If you get into a bad relationship. It's like it's like a marriage. Some of the happiest people I know are on their second marriage. Some of the other happiest are on their first marriage. So if you do it right, it's good. But I've just seen practices that they were brought together um, that just didn't work out. One was, you know, Berkeley Slade. Uh, Dr. Slade was part of, it was called the Berkeley Slade Refractive Institute. And it was Ralph Berkeley and Stephen Slade. And they were they were they were right there, progressive. But but it they together it it wasn't a good fit. So they They've separated, and that's fine. Dr. Slade's got incredible practice. Berkeley has his practice, but Berkeley Slade, Berkeley man, didn't work. So I think you have to, if you're a young ophthalmologist or one in your middle years, just be careful and, and be ready that, to know that if the partnership, if it, if it doesn't feel right and it's not right and it's affecting the practice, then maybe you should go back on your own. I mean, there's, there's, it's not always safety in numbers, but I've seen it where it doesn't, it doesn't work out. So I salute the ones who have gone apart and gone their ways and done well mm-hmm. and didn't force it. If it's not right, it's not right. Okay, um, so you, you've you asked us these questions in the past. Yeah. What would you like your legacy to be? What would you <laughs> like Mike Mann's <laughs> legacy to be? So my legacy, I would hope that um, that I could walk into any meeting and see any surgeon that I've ever worked with. We've been fired along the way. We've worked ourselves out of a job. We've done, you know, any business. Um, I would like my legacy to be that that Mike always listened and tried to do the best he could for our practice and for our industry, and then I could always trust Mike to do the right thing. I've never, I've never, I've never asked our my clients for anything. Uh, in their business for financial assistance or anything else, I've never prom- I've never promoted my business to anyone. But I, so I'd like my legacy to be: there goes the refractive guy that was there from the days of radio keratotomy. Great guy, trustworthy, likable, built a good business, and is a is a fun guy to go to dinner with. You know, and if and if along the way, it used to kill me. I grew up with nothing. You know, and I went to the Marine Corps and got, you know, got my college paid for and came out and started this business. And then I, then I get into ophthalmology and then I start going to opt and I can only do one per one per market. So I'd go up to San Francisco or I'd go to Amarillo or I'd go to New York City or Long Island, wherever it was, you know, at San Diego. And sometimes the doctor would say, hey, look. Why don't you come out to the house? I've got a big house. Stay at my house. Meet the family. So it would be better if, you know, because I've got other work to do when I'm on the road. But I'd always say, sure, I'd love to come. So I, I was living and staying with all my clients from like day one. They trusted me to, to stay in their homes. But it, it, it was crushing me. I'd walk into these people's homes and I'd go, oh, my goodness, this is three, four, five cars. Kids are all beautiful, incredible, going to wonderful schools and colleges. And I, I just I just see this, this, this lifestyle that I would say, I'm never going to be able to attain. And it really, to come where I was from, to be, to be brought on the inside of that. It's like walking into a movie star's home. You know, you, you look around, you go, oh, dude, this $40 million house is pretty nice. So I'd call my wife and I'd say, I'd say, honey, man, we're, we're just losers. <laughs> you know, we're losers. Our kids are losers. Our car, you know, I said, I don't know why. I was just got exposed to that success. 
And then my wife says, you know what? You're not a doctor. And there's a reason you want a doctor. I'm not a doctor. There's a reason I'm not a doctor. Our parents weren't doctors. The world needs smart people to be surgeons. They work very hard. Most of them are hourly employees. So whatever they have, they're working really hard to get. They didn't get there by, by not putting in way, way, way more educational service, surgical, whatever, free hours than you and I did. So the world needs them. Whatever they've done, that's their respite in life. That's that's their part of their safe haven. So you go there, you enjoy it, and you'd be happy for this. So since that time, but I went through like a year or two of depression. I went not depression. It was like, I'm never going to be good enough to, to get that. But I told myself, these guys work hard. And they work, you know, they work weekends. So Saturday morning, they're, they're in the clinic seeing patients. They love what they do. I said, I love what I do. So I started working. I mean, initially I was working six, seven days a week. Business started to grow. And now, I mean, I've, I've got to a point in life where my kids are all through law school, graduate school, college. I've paid for it all, no debt. A guy, you know, life is really good for me right now. And I'm thinking, thank God it didn't. I mean, I think the examples I learned from people, I used to also not, you know, I used to think, I don't. So my wife has a higher deserve level than me. Higher and what? Deserve level. This is a deserve level. Candy may not appreciate this, but she used to drive through River Oaks every day. And she had a, first of all, she had an old cassette tape and it was the power of positive thinking. And she'd drive through River Oaks and she would say, I deserve a house just like this. If I work hard enough, I deserve what these people have. We were living in a 1,200 square foot bungalow in the Heights we bought for $74,000. She's driving through River Oaks. And so one day we're driving through River Oaks. I'm with her, you know, and she's going, I think we should, you know, we, um, we could, we could have a house like this. And I said, of course, we will never have a house like this in our entire lives. There's no way. She said, you don't have a very high deserve level. For some reason, you don't think that you deserve things in life if you work hard. And I said, what you said, I said, deserve level. And she said, yes. If you work hard and have the, a, a high deserve level and work toward what you deserve, you achieve it. That's what that is. And so I said, golly. And so that's that's what I learned in this whole process early on is that you work hard, you deserve things in life that, that you work hard for, and you should have them. So nice cars, nice homes. I, I never thought I, I needed it or deserved that. Now, if I want a nice car, of course, I go I try and go buy one or, or whatever. So I thank the ophthalmologists for, for exposing me to that, for getting me in their homes, letting me, allowing me the privilege of, of, of staying in their homes. I had one client, Avery Rush in Amarillo, beautiful home. His kids were all, they all were incredible athletes. They all won state championships in tennis. They all went to college and tennis scholarships and, and all those things, super smart kids. I'm staying there one night in their house. They're, they're underground their house, beneath the ground. They have tennis courts and basketball courts and a, and a workout facility. It's, it's incredible. And so one day, um, Dr. Rush says, hey, Mike, can you help Jave with his, uh, his physics project? I said, Dr. Rush? I said, Jave's like in 11th grade. <laughs> he probably knows more about physics than I do. I'm not, I wasn't pre-med. I was a, a journalist. I was communications major. I said, sure, I'll go in there with, with Jave and see if I can help him with his physics project. But, you know, it, but it just, it, it gave me the feeling that, that wow, you know, these guys, I mean, I also saw that the, how ophthalmologists were raising their children. I wasn't raised that way. And so that influenced me also I said, wow, if we keep the same format, you know, about raising children, I think that it could be beneficial. And that's we so I've kind of adopted a lot of those things with my children, you know, and they lawyers and bankers and they've all done very well, better than than me, perhaps. But uh, but get back to your question. I, I hope that my legacy is great guy, did the right thing, trusted him, let him stay at my house. And I hope we get to enjoy life together sometime. <laughs> right. Well, I think that's uh, that's a wrap. All right. Unless so you have anything else to that's say? What, that's what we say. No, it's uh, <laughs> well, the one question I, 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 I put on there was, do I love ophthalmologists more than I love ophthalmology? 
And man, there are some super cool ophthalmologists out there. I mean, I've met, I'm now I, I go every year to speak at the ESCRS in Europe. So now I'm meeting the guys on the European front. I see how different the European surgeons are from the U.S. surgeons. I think U.S. surgeons are a little bit more driven. I think Europe is more academic and more clinical, but learning they want to be more U.S. type private, private practice. But a lot of great, I mean, I don't know what drew you to ophthalmology, what drew, what draws anybody that sees this to ophthalmology. But from an outsider looking in that never gets to play on your side of the field, there's something that the eyes draw you into that makes you a pretty cool person to be around. Because you're, I mean, you're, you're, I don't know if it's the focus or what kind of life you, but it, you know, vers- I mean, I think ophthalmologist versus orthopedic surgeon, if you're picking up what I'm putting. I see more orthopedic surgeons who are the, the football guy, the, you know, they're, they're, it's a different mentality. It's, it's uh, divide and conquer. Ophthalmic surgeons are just have a, there's a cooler side. They're always seeking, always pushing, always learning, having fun, all their meeting. The first thing I learned about ophthalmology was, you guys have meetings in cool places. I've been to the Hawaiian Eye meeting like 20 times. I would have never gone to Hawaii. I've been everywhere on the European continent, on the ESCRS. So, but there's something about, so I I love ophthalmologist, you know, a lot. And, uh, but ophthalmology, if I could go back, start over, would I be a journalist again? Or would I stay in ophthalmology? I think I'd, I'd stay in ophthalmology. It's just been, I mean, it's just a super interesting field. I mean, and, and, and to see it evolve, you think, okay, we've reached, we're, now we're at the pinnacle of, of here. You come back in 10 years and say, I'm sure there'll be another Mike Malley and another Shannon Wong that will say, man, look what we're doing now. And I mean, can you imagine? How many practices have you worked with directly? Over the course of 32 years, three, 400, mm. you know. Um, we average you know, 30 a year and they've, they've, they've flipped and they've evolved. And what's happened is that now um, the second generation of let's say Wong's or Gordon's or Berkeley's or Wallace's or Lusk, um, the kids are coming back now Mm -hmm. to run the practices. So I'm, so I'm getting, I'm phasing myself out a little bit, but I'm getting to meet all these young Mm -hmm family members that I helped with physics when they were 11, Dr. Rush has three children who were two are ophthalmologists and one's a psychiatrist, Mm -hmm. you know? So, um, so there's, I've worked with a lot and for the most part, I really haven't met too many, you know, ones I didn't, I didn't like a lot that really weren't in it for the wrong reason. I haven't really met and it maybe, maybe sounds cliche, but I mean, I, I, at the core, yes, it's, it's a great business. To, and if you run it right, it can be a, a phenomenal, successful financial business. But I think every single one of you guys that, that are in it and are making it are in it because you love it. it the, the money thing follows, which is great. If you ever get into a business where if it's your passion and money follows, that's you're, you're so lucky. I think that everyone I've met in ophthalmology, I don't care how wealthy they are, they 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 still they're in it because they love what they do and to me that's that's a field where you want to be in and that's that's pretty cool mike thank you oh thanks for having me it's been yeah, great it's right. a, it's uh sorry it's so emotional for me it's been <laughs> we had an oprah moment or yeah i know 30 moment. i mean uh well 32 years you get you yeah. can have one of those but it's amazing how that one stood out because when the woman told me that her mother put lipstick on i thought it just it just got to me. And she goes, she never wears lipstick. She puts lipstick on to go see an ophthalmologist. Do you think that ophthalmologist? So that that that's like wow. It just like a yeah. That's why even to this well in our current climate, you can't shake their hand. You can't give them a high five. You can't show your face. You can't breathe on them. You can't get within six feet of them. This is so unnatural. And, yeah. Oh, I, I never thought. I haven't thought about it from your standpoint. I was worried because. One of the first ophthalmologists in China who died, it was an yeah, ophthalmologist. Right. And then I thought, well, it's because you're at the slit lamp, you're so close to a patient. Number one. So there is this, you know, there's there's that involvement. But yeah, you have the you have the physical separation, then you have that whole social 
separation. And your practice has always been one where it's it's been family. It's it's you treat patients like family. You know, I think it. I think it's led to just irrational fear. This COVID thing, because if you, if you think about it, let's say I'm a police officer, I go out every day. Well, should I just shelter in because oh, I might, I might get something that may harm me, or I might be hospitalized, or uh, God forbid, I might die, or you know, if you're in the military, these that's a. That's just something, that's life. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think uh, I'm probably in the minority at this point. Hopefully I'll be in the majority soon where we just need to live our lives and just get back to. Well, you know, I, I know what's, what, what use is it really if you come back to there's no life to come back to? You're, if, we're, if, you, if jobs, economy, safety, if, it, if it's all, you know, chaos and what kind of life is that? I think yeah. if, if everyone just is sensible about it, you know, and understands, okay, let's, let's, Let's enjoy life, but let's be aware. But let's let's get back to living yeah. and having a life because we just went through two months of of you know. Luckily, you had your uh, your Murphy's challenge. Yeah. That was <laughs> yeah, that's fun. Uh, yeah, that that's that was. Yeah. Imp- but we need to be able to smile and express no, ourselves yeah. with our faces and not have these. Well, even this has been masks. has been fun. It's yeah. been uh, we're doing these you know, even these Zoom calls, but just it was just good to. to we did our. We came together for our filming, you know, uh, a few weeks ago. Even that, it was, it was good just to get out. I mean, you don't realize that humans are. That's who we are. Yeah, you don't connect over Zoom. No, 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 and you don't connect behind masks, and you don't connect uh, in your house by yourself. It's just. Um, so these are these are strange times, but I'm. I may be in the minority too, but I think if, you know, but I think Texas is is coming back, you know, in a way where. Um, it's it's the right thing to do, and the country should follow. And we'll see. Yeah, hopefully we'll see. Yeah, <laughs> with crowds. Okay, thanks. Ah, uh, thank you. All right, enjoyed it. So we'll wrap this okay. up. I'll hit pause.